Okay. Okay. So we're back on the record, right? Yeah, we're back on the record in the on our petition hearing. And uh, right before we went back on, um, Ms. Kellogg said you have two more questions yes. for uh, the petitioner. Yes. Go ahead. Um, you testified earlier that you comply with CGMP. Um, do you comply with all requirements no, no. of CGMP? No, I did not say I comply. We are working with, we're, we're going in that direction, but no, I do not comply with CGMP. So and there's a lot to, and, and if you would see how much there is, it's it's almost impossible for 503A. Okay. And um, who, what are the um, qualifications for your QA manager? Well, one is experience. And experience of close to 20 years. Also was the person who has made hundreds of thousands of medications, so had a tremendous amount of experience, is involved in all FDA inspections, Board of Pharmacy inspections for the quality control. She does all the training. She, because she did a lot of the training and oversees the training, actually she probably trained almost every person, I would say, in the whole company that is actually compounding. And uh, so her experience at the pharmacy, plus the classes that we send her to, and the trainings that we've sent her to critical point, I felt that she was probably, uh, and, and she's a good person too, uh, a very good, honest person that pays attention to detail. That's. That's what you really got to do in a compounding pharmacy because there is so much detail. And is that person a pharmacist? No. Is it a pharmacy technician? Yes. And is that person versed in CGMP? She's going in that process, correct. Okay. So, you know, she's starting to learn that. I have nothing further at this time. Okay, did that raise any more questions from um, uh, Petitioner's Council for this witness? No, Your Honor. Does that raise any other questions from anyone on the board for this witness? I see no hands. Okay, so Mr. Petzelka, you have um, a witness you want to call? Yes, Your Honor. I would like to call uh, Mr. Richard Rhodes. Okay, Mr. Gross? Rhodes. Well, I'm going to let him spell his name, <laughs> sir. So, Mr. Rhodes, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California? And you just sit down and say, I do, again. I do. Thank you. Uh, sir, would you please state and spell your name? Richard Rhodes. Last name is spelled R-H-O-A-D-S. Okay, proceed with your question, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, uh, could you tell us um, how long approximately do you know Mr. Grassella and in what capacity? I was hired by University Compounding Pharmacy in 2007. In the last three years, I was promoted to Director of Compounding and have worked very closely with Joe on issues of regulatory compliance and quality assurance. I'm very much involved in much of the list of major improvement actions in conjunction with Joe under Joe's leadership. Thank you. Uh, how would you describe Mr. Grassella as a pharmacist? Joe is a man that cares deeply. He has a, a heart for people. He wants to do the right thing. He actually puts his money where his mouth is and he's willing to spend money. He's willing to put resources. I. In, in thinking about all of the efforts that we have done, I can honestly tell you I do not remember a time when we've talked about an initiative for updating our quality assurance or sending people to training. I can't remember a time where he said no. I can't remember a time where he, he said don't worry about that. Or I mean he was always the one either pushing it or approving it. Um, we 
many of the things that we have done have been because of Joe's efforts and initiative to make sure that everything we're doing is the highest quality, to make sure that, that we're following all the laws and that we have no issues with quality. That's what I've really been working with Joe on almost on a daily basis for the last three years. Thank you. Uh, as you're aware, there have been some violations um, of various uh, regulatory provisions uh, that occurred at the pharmacy in the past. Could you describe to us the differences, the changes that had occurred under uh, Mr. Grassello's leadership within the past two years? In my view, it's been dramatic. I've seen, been with this pharmacy. I think as a whole, it's important to lay out the, the backdrop that the change in the industry has been dramatic. The industry today is, looks nothing like it did five years ago or even three years ago. But I think that the list of improvements, although this is not comprehensive, really shows you that th this is not something that we just started a month ago just for this, this hearing. We've been at this day in and day out to make sure that we have the most trained and, and well, most, the well, most well-trained staff uh, in the state. And I really believe that. Our, our pharmacists, just to re reiterate some of the things we're talking about with training, I don't want to belabor the point, but all of our sterile compounding staff not only does the online critical point training, which I, I believe is somewhere around 40 hours, I'm not sure positive, but also we sent all of our staff to hands-on training at critical point. Our main pharmacist went to the boot camp. I've been sent to the boot camp twice, did the certification for the QP503A, Joe sent me to CGMP training at Parental Drug Association, um, and, and one of the trainings was, was a two-week-long training. I mean, there's, this is not like fly-by-night stuff. I mean, we really care. This is what we live and breathe. This is what we do. And Joe is the one that's pushing this. This is like his life. And I know this because I work with him. I mean, especially over the last three years, I've had so many meetings with him on a weekly basis about how to improve things, and he has, he's, he has been the one pushing all of this. Did you ever get an impression that Mr. Grassella would knowingly or willfully violate law? My, my understanding, and I can speak to over the last three years as I've been working with Joe, my understanding is that Joe is very conscientious about following the law. I remember the, the day that he made the decision to not press pellets anymore, even though we were told by, um, I, I believe we were told by our counsel, I, I, I was not personally told that, but he told me that-, that Objection hearsay. Um, Objection hearsay. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, I understand. Sustained. Yeah, I understand. So we, we discontinued pressing pellets even though it was our, my impression and our impression as a team that we were legally able to do that. And the reason was that we wanted to make sure that we're following all, all of the laws. We put a huge amount of effort to make sure that we followed the, the new HD laws that went into effect January 2017. Um, we remodeled all of our clean room facilities, hired consultants. It's, it was a very expensive thing, but mo most importantly, it was very productive to have people that really know their industry leaders come in and look at everything in your pharmacy. It's not one person. These are several people that came in on a regular basis. This is what we're used to. And um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the original question about, about that, but my, my impression is that Joe is very conscientious about following the laws and making sure our pharm pharmacy follows or exceeds the laws, um, not only the state, but in other states and also USP. Uh, thank you. Um, no further questions. Okay, Ms. Kellogg? Yes. Uh, when did you start working for uh, Mr. Grisella? It was April of 2007. In April 2007? Yes, ma'am. I thought you testified earlier that you worked three years for. Um, uh, no, in my current position as director of compounding, I've been since I believe it was May of 2015 when I have my current position. Okay, but you've you've been working with him as a pharmacist since 2007. Yes, ma'am. And 
So isn't it uh, true that um, under the current regulations um, that you're required, co current compounding regulations that you're required, all sterile compounders are required to train their personnel? Yes. And isn't it true that under the current regulations that sterile compounders are required to conduct, conduct studies to justify longer beyond use dates? Under, under the current regulation, yeah, and, and are you, I'm sorry, are you referring to sterile? Sterile. Y yes, that's my understanding. And isn't it true under the current regulations um, that sterile compounders typically retain co consultants to make the improvements to comply with the sterile compounding regulations? Can you repeat, repeat the question, please? And isn't it true that sterile compounders typically retain consultants to make improvements to their sterile compounding um, processes so that they can comply with um, current regulations? Objection, calls for conjecture and speculation. Overruled if you know the answer, sir. I, I, I don't know the answer. It would be much of a guess. I certainly okay, am aware. Okay, then stop. I don't want you to guess, okay? Yep. And is, isn't it true that sterile compounders um, purchase upgraded equipment to um, comply with current reg sterile compounding regulations? I, I can only speak to our, our pharmacy. But isn't it true that, you, uh, that UCP purchase upgraded equipment to comply with um, current um, sterile compounding regulations? In part, yes. Okay, I have nothing further. Okay, okay. now does anyone from the board have any questions, I'm going to go back to my left again, and please state your name. Ricardo Sanchez, no, uh, no questions. Okay, next person in line. Uh, Debbie Veal, um, professional licensee member. Um, I only have uh, one question, and that is in regards to the expiration date issue that we've talked about earlier. Um, I think Dr. Gutierrez um, asked Mr. Grisella about this also. The um, using the 365, uh, using an expiration date that's 365 days from when it was uh, produced. Um, do, are you are you in agreement with the the logic uh, that uh, Mr. Grisella spoke to you? Do you remember? And I can tell you what I remember. If you want me to ask that qu the question that way, please. So what I remember him saying is that he used 365 days um, and he didn't think that that was a problem because he knew the, the person would use up the medication way before 365 days. The way that personally I practice pharmacy is that the beyond use state that is labeled on the preparation needs to follow all regulations in the state. So there is a professional opinion about the stability, and I think most people, most pharmacists, I certainly do, you make judgments based on your understanding of the physical and chemical properties of the drug, but it's my the way that I practice pharmacy is that the labeled beyond use state must follow the laws and regulations of, of the state. And so just as the, um, I think you're the director of compounding. Correct. Um, and so would that not be something that you would have reviewed and? I've been in my position for three years. Uh, this issue that we're talking about occurred before that. I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do you have any questions, sir? Uh, Stan Weiser, no questions. Okay, what about you? Victor Law, no questions. Okay, next. Amy Gutierrez, thank you for, for your testimony. Okay, the, the mics aren't on, you know, some of oh. you aren't. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Amy Gutierrez, thanks for your testimony. Okay, okay. next, sir. Greg Lippi, uh, no questions, thank you. Okay, next. Lavonzo Butler, no questions. Next. Valerie Munoz, no questions. Alan Shad, no questions. Albert Wall, no question. Okay, now, Mr. Uh, uh, Petzelka, do you have any additional questions for this witness? <coughs> yes, I do, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, um, you were asked previously about uh, 
the uh, level of training. And you testified that it is uh, required by the state of California to train compounding personnel. Is the level of training that UCP engages in comparable or merely compliant with the requirements of the state, or is it at a different level? Based on my understanding of the requirements in the law, the, the scope of the training and the depth of the training exceeds that, mostly in the fact that we research and learn the uh, requirements for CGMP, and um, that is certainly well above and beyond what is outlined and required by the law. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. Ms. Kellogg? Yes. Um, did you compound the pellets that were an issue in the underlying accusation case? Based on my recollection, I, I had no involvement in the compounding of the pellets. And isn't it true that, you're, that while you're trained, uh, you may have some training in CGMP, um, your pharmacy does not follow CGMP? I, I can say that we do not follow everything with CGMP. Our, again, our goal is to try to achieve as much as we can, as close as we can, with every month that passes, uh, what CGMP, what we can as a 503A pharmacy. I have nothing further. I just wanted to ask one thing. Um, you are a pharmacist, right? Correct. Because no one asked you. Are you, are you licensed in California? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, did, did any of the follow-up questions raise any follow-up questions for anyone on the board? I'm just going to see if there's a show of hands. I'm seeing shaking no. heads. Okay. Oh, I, I have a hand over there. Go ahead. T state your name, please. Yeah. Albert Wong, professional member. Uh, knowing what you know now, um, from here on, what kind of expression that you will be put on the pellet that you will be making? Uh, sir, we, we do not currently compound pellets. Um, I can tell you that any preparation, no matter what it would be, <clears throat> under my leadership and under the management that we have in our pharmacy, the expiration date would follow the limitations based in the, in the law. So I, 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 it would be speculation for me. I don't know. Because we don't compound pellets. Oh, I mean, you will not put, uh, you know, arbitrary in one year, 365 day. Sir, I, I would not, if, if it was not um, compliant with the law and not backed by studies, I would not do that. Okay. No further question. Okay. Did that raise any follow-up with uh, in either lawyers? No, no Your Honor. You. Okay. All right. I think you're excused now. And so who's your next witness? Um, I would like to call Dr. Jenny Partridge. Okay. Hi, Ms. Partridge. Would you please uh, raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California? I do. Okay, you can have a seat. You're, you're, you're Dr. Partridge? Yes. Okay, would you please state and spell your name? Virginia, V-I-R-G-I-N-I-A, Partridge, P A R. T-R-I-D-G-E. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, would you please briefly state your qualifications? I'm a licensed pharmacist in the state of California. I spent um, about two decades in the pharmaceutical industry with Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson. Uh, most recently, I, my expertise is in the field of compounding. I am a certified inspector. There are some states that do non-resident sterile inspections. They require licenses in their state, similar to California. I'm a certified inspector for the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Florida as a non-resident sterile compounding inspector. I'm also a surveyor for the Accreditation Commission of Healthcare, and they have a medley of services that they accredit. The ones that I have been certified to do are sterile compounding pharmacy, non-sterile compounding, infusion care, infusion nursing, ambulatory infusion care, and specialty pharmacy. Um, and then in addition, I work as a consultant to help people comply with state and federal compliance and regulations as it relates to compounding. I have probably surveyed and inspect 
uh, and or inspected over 100 pharmacies across the United States. Thank you. Are you familiar with uh, the university compounding pharmacy and the disciplinary terms uh, that are currently in effect at that pharmacy? Yes, I'm aware of the um, original accusation and the stipulated settlement, and I am their probation consultant, which is one of the requirements of the stipulated settlement that they have a monthly consultant. I, I am the consultant that goes and does their monthly audits. In addition to um, complying with what the board requires, which is you do the self-assessments on a monthly basis, I actually go, um, I do some additional work, and I do my own audits and gap analysis. Each month, I dive deep on a specific subject. Um, so for example, one month I might look at environmental monitoring and really drill deep on that. Another month I might look at the beyond use dates and the expiration dates. Uh, and I can attest to the fact that something I look at is to ensure that all labeled compounds and master formulas are in compliance with beyond use state regulations. Approximately how many visits or inspections have you conducted at University Compounding Pharmacy? Their stipulated settlement was effective in April 2016. My monthly audit started in May of 2016, so um, approximately 23 monthly audits. Based on your observations and your reports to the board, um, how would you characterize the compliance level of University Compounding Pharmacy within the past 24 months? I'd like to give a relative perspective. I first um, was introduced to University Compounding Pharmacy as a PCAB inspector for sterile and non-sterile compounding in June of 2014. I'm a contracted inspector, so I objectively go in, I rate them, I you know, do my observations. When I look at where they were in June of 2014 and where they were in um, May of 2016 when I started, I just saw a tremendous difference in the investment and culture of quality and compliance. In the 23 months that I've been there, I just see a continual um, resource allotment to staff, training, and quality. Uh, the, the, I'm, I'm gonna give some examples where I do see where they've talked about going, trying to lead towards CGMP. Uh, and I look at not only California law, but USP, and so I make sure they've got that compliance. In addition to a full-time staff QA person, they have three people that are devoted to quality. When I ask them for records, they are so organized and so buttoned up, and they tend to have the answers, and they tend to be very concerned if I see something that I think could be improved. They, they work very hard to make that improvement and will maybe email me in between my monthly audits and say, is this correct? Can we do this? Do you have suggestions to do this better? Um, and so overall, I just see uh, uh, some very strong personal responsibility, not only among, you know, with Joe, making sure that everything is done correctly, but the staff is empowered. I was fortunate that in one of my monthly audits, there was a, a management lead meeting, and I don't normally see these in pharmacies, but they spent their lunchtime hour going over leadership uh, videos. They were looking at the five disciplines of leadership. Um, I can't remember the uh, person. I think it's John, not John Maslow, but anyway. Th this is where they're, they're teaching their staff leadership and personal responsibility and people development. And each one of their staff, when I interview them and or, you know, question them on their compliance, they, they, they know their stuff and they take personal responsibility for that. I think the biggest testament that I could give, and I don't give this lightly, is that I would have my personal prescription for a compounded sterile preparation filled at University Compounding Pharmacy. Um, thank you. Um, based on your observations during the um, past 23 or so visits, um, in your professional opinion, do you believe that uh, the respondents in this case are good candidates for early termination of probation? 
I wrote a letter to that fact, and, and it was a long letter um, because I do feel strongly that the um, protocol, the policies and procedures, and the culture and the leadership does the utmost to ensure patient safety and a high quality of medication that's dispensed. And yes, I wholeheartedly support early termination of their probation. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Okay, Ms. Ms. Kellogg, go ahead. Thank you. Um, is it your testimony that you went out as a P PCAB inspector in June of 2014? Uh, we can't hear you oh. for some reason. I couldn't, at least. Okay. So is it your testimony that you were a PCAB inspector at UCP in June of 2014? Yes. And uh, when was your next inspection of UCP after June of 2014? May of 2016 as their probation consultant. Okay. And when you did the inspection as a PCAB inspector in June of 2014, um, did you inspect their compounding of the pellets at issue in this case? Yes. And w uh, where were they compounding um, the pellets at that time? In what kind of environment? What is required by USP, which is what PCAB uh, follows is USP Chapter 797. They require pre-sterilization in an environment ISO 8 or better, and so they were doing the pre-sterilization in the ISO 8 or better, and the sterilization, I believe, was done outside. It's been a little bit while. Uh, so they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, doing um, the pre-sterilization processes in an uncertified room when you did the inspection? I don't believe so. And does USP 797 allow uh, compounding in an uncertified room, pre-sterilization processes in an uncertified room? USP Chapter 797 requires pre-sterilization in an ISO 8 certified room or better. Okay. Then that's a yes then, correct? The answer is a yes? It's not So USP 797 does not allow a comp uh, pre-sterilization processes in an uncertified room, correct? No. Correct. That's correct, right? Yes. And did you, um, did you in when you were inspecting them in June of 2014, were you inspecting them for compliance with Section 4127.7? No. And why is that? Be because at that point, um, well, I take that back, Desiree, the answer would be yes. So PCAB requires us to follow all state and federal laws in addition to the PCAB standards. And so then I should know all of the state laws. And so then um, the answer would be yes, but um, you know, so I don't know at that point um, it, if I was aware that 4127.7 required them to have compounded in an ISO 5 environment. So you weren't aware of uh, section 4127.7 in June of 2014? No. Okay. I was aware of the 1751 and 1735 that regulated compounding, not the statute. I was not really aware of that at that point. Okay. And do you recall if you were retained as an expert to testify on Mr. Grissell and UCP's behalf in the accusation matter? Yes. I, during the, I was asked to write an opinion. Okay. And were you asked to testify at the hearing as well? I don't recall because it didn't go to hearing. Okay. I understand. And do you recall in your report if you um, opined about the application of Section 4127.7? I believe I did, and I believe what my opinion was, was that it would be dangerous to do pre-sterilization in an ISO 5 environment. Um, but it was your opinion that um, Section 4127.7 um, did not apply uh, to the facts in this case, correct? I would not say it did not apply. I would have provided an opinion that said that it could have caused harm to patients. Um, did you uh, provide an opinion that applying Section 4127.7 was inappropriate in these cases? I don't recall, but based on what I am thinking and saying right now, I think it would have been dangerous to apply 
doing a pre-sterilization of pellets in the ISO 5 environment per 4127.7. I'll repeat the question again, though. Um, do you um, recall if your opinion was that applying section 4127.7 was inappropriate in these cases? I don't recall. Um, did you want to read it? I think you have it right there. Uh, you wrote, therefore, applying section 4127.7 is inappropriate in these cases. I think it would have been dangerous to apply 4127.7 4, to do um, pre-sterilization of powders, loose powders, in an ISO 5 environment. But at, um, when did you write that report? I don't know. Do you have the date right there? November 10th, 2015. Okay, November 10th, 2015. And, um, Objection, you Your Honor. Uh, what's the relevance of these reports uh, from three years ago to today's proceedings? Okay, hold on a second. Why, why don't you explain the relevance, Ms. Uh, the relevance is that she's uh, been their probation monitor who has been certifying their compliance with um, the state laws and regulations, yet she was also their um, um, expert in the underlying accusation matter, and she issued an opinion opining uh, that their conduct was appropriate and in compliance with um, the state laws and regulations at that time. So you think it's relevant to credibility of the witness? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so objections overruled. Um, and so when you rendered that expert opinion, you had not been um, to UCP at that, in November 2015, you had not inspected UCP since June of 2014 as a PCAB inspector, correct? Correct. So you don't know what kind of germ-free um, model BBF clean bench class two type A laminar flow biological safety cabinets they were using or not, correct? I spoke through the attorney and with the client to determine the facilities and looked at the master formula records to determine the equipment used and the process that they used. But you did not personally inspect them when you uh, rendered your expert opinion? In no. I have nothing further at this time. Okay. Anyone on the board have any questions they want to ask? Is, should I just call for hands? Okay. We have one hand up. Go ahead, sir, and state right. your name, please. My name is Stan Weiser, and I'm a licensed professional pharmacist. And so, um, uh, uh, Mr. Prezelka uh, wrote uh, uh, to the board uh, regarding this case, and uh, one uh, paragraph, and if you don't, well, excuse me, reading it. Uh, subsequent to the imposition of discipline of uh, Mr. Grisella, the re relevant part of section 4127.7 of the code has been repealed with the board's report support. In fact, the very conduct that served as grounds for discipline in, uh, in the instant case would have been permissible under the current application, uh, applicable uh, California regs, as well as under the ap applicable um, uh, industry standard articulated in USP 797. So do you agree with that? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Weiser, could you repeat the last little bit again? Which page is yeah, which, which it's page three of four. So it's part of exhibit From three? California, yeah. It's, it, and it's, did, did, what, what question does it say it's a response to on that? Page three of seven. It's page three of four. Yeah. Oh, it's a letter? It's a letter. Yes, I agree with that. Thank you. All right, I see another hand. Go ahead, say your name and ask your question, sir. Uh, Victor Law, a licensee member. Um, Dr. Patrick, so in your expert opinion on the testosterone palace in question, what should be the correct beyond you state? 
the beyond use date for any compounded preparation is going to be one of two things. It's either going to be according to the USP 797 guidelines and or California regs, which we are actually consistent on at, with current law, and or if they have done stability studies. And it is very specific to the ingredients, the equipment, and the facilities that they use. So would you, it's not an arbitrary one year, so what date would you be looking at? You're looking at the... So, so I do this on a monthly basis whenever I do any of my probation audits. I will take some finished products that are waiting for patients to pick up and or to be shipped, and I will look at the beyond use date assigned. If it is outside of the regulation or guideline, then I will ask for rationale and I will look at their master formula record and ensure that they either have a reference source or a stability study that is specific to their facility and their equipment and their ingredients and process. Does, so does normally, that help? Well, yes or no. So normally, would that be over a year, mostly, or usually it's within a year? It, the, the guidelines for, some, for a sterile injectable that would be high risk, which this is. Um, frozen would be 45 days. Let's just say that would be the max. If you do over that, then I'm going to look at a study, a stability study by a lab that, that tells me what that date is. It, and it, it may be you know, 90 days, it may be 120 days. Um, frequently when you do stability studies, and this is what I'll look for, you'll see an odd number like an 82 days. And that's when I know there's a real study, not just a, an arbitrary 90 or 120. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions on, on my right side? I see no hands. I think that means there's no questions. All right, did that raise any additional follow-up questions for you, Mr. Petzelska? No, Your Honor. What about you, Ms. Kellogg? No, Your Honor. Okay, this witness is excused. And Mr. Petzelka, any other witnesses you brought with you? No, Your Honor, we're done. Okay, so now we can do closing uh, statements. Uh, first, Ms. Kellogg. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, it appears as though petitioners do not adequately acknowledge that they simply failed to follow the law in effect at the time of the violations at issue in the First Amendment ac accusation. They're still arguing that their um, compliance, uh, uh, their their noncompliance was inadvertent uh, when, in fact, um, they were notified by board inspectors of the violations and the requirements. Um, petitioners were untruthful in their petitions when they stated that the quality of UCP's compounding drugs were never in question. They were, in fact, in question with the FDA and the board. Um, they uh, have not engaged in extraordinary rehabilitation measures. All sterile compounders must train their personnel, conduct studies to justify longer BUDs, retain consultants to make improvements, and purchase upgraded equipment. Um, they are not following CGMPs. They pick and choose what they want to follow with them. They say, for example, that they have a QA manager, but that QA manager is a pharmacy technician who is not uh, completely um, conversant with all the CGMP um, uh, procedures. Um, their consultant, their probation consultant, um, has certified that they're in compliance. However, she is the same individual who also was retained as an expert in their case to opine that they did not have to apply, um, that it was inappropriate quote unquote, to follow state laws and regulations and specifically um, section 4127.7. She also um, conducted an inspection of June in 2014 and she didn't note that they were not complying with section 4127.7 because she was not aware of it. I have nothing further at this time. Okay. All right, sir, it's your turn. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the instant case, presents an individual and a pharmacy that have been in business for over 25 years. In those 25 years of service, to the best of Mr. Grassella's recollection, there have not been a single incident 
of a complaint about quality of a product of any injury caused by his product. We spent a fair amount of time belaboring the point that they violated the law. And Mr. Grassella never argued that he was perfect. There have been failures. There have been errors made. But those errors were not intentional violations of law. Yes, respondents failed to adhere to the law, but it was not because they wanted to. It was because they misinterpreted the application of the law. And as the subsequent repeal of that law shown, it was probably a reasonable mis misinterpretation, certainly not intentional. The efforts that have gone to the pharmacy in form of mitigation, in form of rehabilitation, have indeed been extraordinary. Yes, pharmacies are required to train their personnel, but are they required to train their personnel to the extent to which Mr. Grassella does it? No. Mr. Grassella is an individual who takes his personal responsibility and personal pride into whatever he does. It doesn't matter if it's compounding or washing cars. He wants to do it the right way. And he spares no expense in making sure that his pharmacy immediately corrects whatever deficiencies, whether real or perceived, may have occurred. There is no question that the violations have occurred. And we're not here to dispute that. But we'd like to respectfully ask the board to consider not only Mr. Grassella's failures, but also his efforts to mitigate these failures, to remedy them, and to put sufficient safeguards in his pharmacy to ensure that the violations will not reoccur and that the patient's safety will continue to be the paramount of Mr. Grassella's efforts. And that is the key point. While the pharmacies are not required to adhere to uh, the standards articulated in CGMP, Mr. Grassella chose to strive for that adherence. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to do so for a retail pharmacy. And Mr. Grassella is making con consistent and continuing efforts to do so. These efforts are not something that he started doing last month or last week just for the purpose of filing this petition. As the evidence had shown in your pockets, he's been engaged in these continuous efforts for more than two years, day in, day out. This is not a fly-by-night effort. This is something that is consistent and it's not done for the purpose of reducing his, his penalty, but it's done for the purpose of ensuring patient safety. And that is what I would like to bring to the board's attention. At this point, we believe that termination of Mr. Grassella's probation and the probation for university compounding pharmacy would be in the public interest because at this point, continuing probation will not have any additional margin of public safety that would be added to the current situation. In fact, it would only serve one and only purpose, and that is punitive purpose. At this point, continuing to burden Mr. Grassella and his pharmacy with the burden of probation will only punish him further than it already has. As Mr. Grassella testified, uh, the impact on his business, on, on the lives of his employees, have been very dramatic. And I believe that at this point of time, the termination, the early termination would in fact be in public interest. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Kellogg, did you want to reply? Yes, okay, I go did. Ahead. Um, Mr. Gasella agreed to be put on probation for four years. The board put him on probation and his pharmacy on for four years. Continued probation will, will ensure continued compliance with um, current laws and regulations. And this is particularly important because petitioner still does not acknowledge entirely that he failed to follow the laws in effect at the time of the violations and the first amended accusation, even though he had notice from the board and there was the filing of an accusation and a first amended accusation. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, the case is submitted. The board is going to discuss it in closed session and then you'll get a written decision in the mail. So um, the, the record on this is closed. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor.
So we'll uh, go into closed session to deliberate and then open up afterwards, probably a good opportunity to get some lunch in the meantime. I don't think, you think we'll probably get back in 30 minutes or by, by 12.30? I think we can probably, it's 11.50 right now. We can probably tentatively look at 12.30 for. Are you, are you adjourning us right now? I'm adjourning us for closed session. Right, right. For closed session. I'm just trying to give the idea so that the those in the audience can grab some okay, lunch. Yeah, I agree. Okay. That it's not going to be, I don't think it's going to, it's only one case. We won't be at this for a couple hours. Right. So we're adjourning into closed session. Back on the record, um, we are now into the Ledge Reg um, Committee. Mr. Lippi? We have such a large audience. <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> All right, well, uh, welcome back for those of you who returned. Uh, first, uh, the following six uh, bills are either board sponsored or originated by the board. And uh, first one, SB 1447, under about automated drug delivery systems, um, uh, now to be called ADDS. The bill would repeal the general ADDS provisions and. Uh, the additional conditions for an ADDS located in a licensed clinic or a health facility. If passed, it will prohibit an ADDS from being installed or operated in the state unless specified requirements are met, including a license for the ADDS issued by the board to the holder of a current valid and active pharmacy license. It will also limit the placement and operation of ADDS to specified locations, including the licensed uh, pharmacy holding that ADDS license, a licensed health facility, a licensed clinic, or a specified medical office, and would require the pharmacy holding the ADDS license to own the ADDS and the drugs and devices located within it. It would also require the pharmacy to supervise the operations of the ADDS. Um, the bill would also prescribe um, stocking, uh, that specified stocking and transfer requirements for those drugs and devices, and it also requires the pharmacy holding the ADDS license to provide training on the operation and use of it uh, to specified individuals and would require the pharmacy to complete periodic self-assessments. Additional conditions for automated patient dispensing systems um, would, uh, let's see, would be required the bill will also authorize a pharmacy inspector employed by the board to enter the location or proposed location of an ADDS to inspect the location pursuant to its provisions. Um, it's a board-sponsored measure, and uh, I don't think uh, there's anything we need to do with yeah. it. Uh, moving on, uh, well, do we have public comment? The one that looks like the little person talking. Oh, right yeah. thank you. <laughs> I don't know which chair here. <laughs> Paige Talley, representing the California Council for the Advancement of Pharmacy. Um, as I said at the Ledge Reg meeting yesterday, we don't have formal positions on legislation yet until the 9th. However, my members have expressed um, some concern over Section 7, 4427.1E, which says that the, the building or area has to be um, inspected prior to granting a license uh, for an ADDS, and that would include both types, the unit dose and the, the patient specific. Um, the concern is that if you have to wait, the patient's quality of life might be compromised because then they would have to rely on the pharmacy, which the pharmacy does make deliveries, but to deliver the meds 
if they're open and it's a stat drug, it has to be there within an hour. If they're not open, it's a um, two hours. For antibiotics or something that isn't stat, it's four hours. So I'm just asking that you think about maybe granting for skilled nursing facilities, the ICFs and, um, and skilled. Um, they've been there for so long, they're usually at the nurses' stations, you know, at, at either wing or if it's two floors, they have a couple of them. Um, maybe a provisional license you could grant. I mean, there is a uh, precedent for it in your law. It's the new 4127.7 oh, that no, allows... Not that number. <laughs> but it's new. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. the, it, it allows for um, a temporary license to be granted to, to compound sterile compounds. And you have is that possible, Jenny? Because I'm not sure what our timeline is right now on getting inspectors out. It can out. just be a minute. Well, the issue is for you. You're, I can't turn it on when you walk out. It's the license. It's the f not that we don't want them licensed. Ab absolutely not oh, bad. I had the wrong button. No, no, no. no. The, the timing. concern is, is that once the law takes effect that we wouldn't have time to do an inspection, hence you would be without a machine for a period mm -hmm. of time. We'll find some way to solve that. that we that, can do that? Yeah. Okay. We'll find some way I to do that. I would appreciate that. Because I think one of the things the board was concerned about is where some of these devices could be located. And so that kind of requires the inspection. If they've already been out there, um, we also will know if the bill's going to be enacted. We'll have an extra four months, and maybe we can start it in July and roll it back a little bit, too, to give everybody plenty of time, which will give us then nine months to get out there and do the inspection. Okay. Uh, but often um, in long-term care, the nursing facilities will drop one uh, contracted pharmacy and go with another one. So those machines belong to the pharmacy, mm. not the nursing. So they have to come in All right. and we'll put in. Let me, let me um, talk think a little bit about to that. staff and see if point. we can find some solution that we can use there. The goal is so that we know where they are. But oh, I, I, get I hear that. your point. You yeah. don't want to be delayed in the ability to right. use these because you've got patient care. And it's a little issues. different in skilled than it is in a pharmacy or a lobby somewhere. You know. No, so, we'll okay. find some way to do All that. All right, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, next. AB 1751. Uh, board already has a support position. We have, you have someone stuck in her. Ah. Sorry. No, you can't talk to them. Uh, sorry, you guys. <laughs> okay. Got back a little tardy from lunch. I apologize. Kate and Patel with Kaiser Permanente. Uh, good to see you again. Um, Regarding 1447, uh, Kaiser certainly supports the efforts here to expand access uh, through the uh, development of, you know, regulations that uh, would would support um, automated dispensing to the patients. Um, the only concern, I guess, that maybe it's not even a concern; it's just a consideration, is that um, it sounds like from the bill language that the 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 statute or the, the regulations would require this to be applied to all refills for consultations. So we would have to have consultations on, on, on any products coming out of these machines. Is that what the board had intended for, for even chronic meds for patients who are, you know, picking up a Lipitor or a glucophage or, and, and, you know, seeking some, some uh, convenience in this, is that something that we can maybe alleviate through, through this process or, there you're talking about medications that will be dispensed to the patient, Correct. not administered to the patient. Correct. Okay, so that's the uh, that type of machine. I, I don't think the board really So, so think it, about the Asteris machine, Jenny, right. and the Asteris yeah, machine, they do some refills, so we don't expect refills, no, right, to be counseled. That, okay, so. because the language yeah, is a little misleading the, that in the bill? Way, okay. That was the way it was drafted by Ledge Council. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make but, sure that was But clarified. there are a couple of other anomalies in the bill that we're going to straighten out because okay. the transition from the from our attorney to Ledge Council left a couple things in the lurch. Perfect. Well, I just want to bring that up, and thank you. Okay. Thank you. AB 1751, uh, this board already has a support position. The measure will allow the Department of Justice to enter into an agreement with an entity operating an interstate data share hub for purposes of interstate sharing of controlled substances reporting information. Uh, the staff comments are that the board is the originator of the, mes of the me measure, as I stated, and has a support position in, in its current form. The only question I had is do we need, because it's been amended, do we need to have a, another support position? And I think the answer is no. Uh, the policy is still the same, and the policy is what you support. 
Okay, great. So that's information only, unless somebody wants to come up and speak on it. Danny Martinez with CPHA. We're happy to support this bill. Thank you. Wow. Thank okay. you. Okay. That's one for us. <laughs> it's actually two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Goose uh, County. Next, AB 1752. Um, this uh, is controlled substances, a uh, cures database. Measure expands cures reporting to also include Schedule 5 controlled substances. And uh, the board is the originator of some of the provisions included in the measure and establish a support position on it uh, during the board's February 2018 meeting. Since that time, the measure was amended to remove the authority of the board to, through regulation, add additional medications that would be tracked into the CURES database. Um, if anybody uh, wants to make a motion to uh, do anything with this, please do. We currently have a support. Yeah, we, ha we do, and these amendments, then you don't feel have changed it enough to require anything. Okay, fine. Uh, do we have public comment? I, I have one question. Who, uh, where did the uh, idea come from to remove the authority of the board, of this board, through regulation to add meds secures? To add meds, the, the um, California Medical Association did not think that was a good idea. Really? And the medical board took a supportive amended position to get that provision out too. But CMA was opposed unless amended on it. They, they, they. I think they were concerned we might run amok. I don't know. So in but other words, gabapentin, for example, add. there's a real specific example. Gabapentin is is a drug that a lot of states are rescheduling right now. The feds haven't acted to do so, but there's concern about the drug being abused by people, and so that would be one of the things that this board would have to promulgate regulations for if they wanted to add it to the controlled substances. Well, um, don't do that because my dog takes it. <laughs> so did mine. I've got a cupboard full of it, probably. I think another one, Jenny, is propofol. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's another one, but that's a little harder to get your hands on, but yeah. Um, but, but I think it's, they just thought we were the wrong body. But I will tell you, as I discussed yesterday, the public safety committees, which are the policy committees in the legislature that he'll hear these bills, will not let us reschedule any additional drugs because it creates a new crime which adds money and cost to government at the state level, and we're not going to be able to amend our provisions. So Absent a catastrophic. In spite of being a consumer protection board and agency. I tried. Yeah, I'm sure you did. So what is our position on this bill? We are sponsoring it. We are support in support. Why, why? We're supporting it as it is and with the removal of the authority. So, so, so we're all comfortable, uh, beside, except me, about supporting something that limits our ability to act responsibly as a consumer protection agency? Well, I think at this time, uh, we don't have any drugs that we would want to add. I'd, I'd rephrase that we, it doesn't grant us the authority to pursue Solely. that avenue. That's, that's really how to say it. I mean, it does, it, it limits us, but we don't have the authority now. It just doesn't authorize us to move in that direction. But I it does allow us to move, work with the medical board. We can always work with the medical board, but again, we won't be able to schedule this drug unless we really put it into the federal or the state schedule. And we'd have a better chance of influencing the feds to do it, I think, right now, because well, Could we modify it so that if uh, we could do it in conjunction with the medical board, would they, would they agree to that? We could, we could suggest it. I'll see if it makes a difference. You think um, that would help, Stan? Well, I think anything is better than, than <laughs> somebody slapping the back of our hand saying you can't do this because for some reason, and here we are trying to protect uh, the consumer. I mean, I don't know what their uh, agenda is, but I certainly know what ours is. Uh, let, me, let me float it to the medical board and see cool. if they'd be interested Thank you. in moving in that direction. And if they would, then I'll run it through um, somebody somewhere. I'm not even sure where I'd go with this one to see if we could have some, some possibility. I suppose we could require our, our entities to do it. But we'd have to modify the, fe the the cures law anyway because it requires federal yeah. controlled substances reporting. So, so what's I don't know. Our stance on it? Right now, we're it's sponsoring it, so we support the bill. And there's some provisions in here we really support. There's just one we lost one that was kind of important to us. So can you 
just one to position. And support if amended? Yeah. Well, well we're sponsors. That's kind of an awkward position for us. Yeah, but they took us out. Well, they took us out because we weren't probably going to get it out of committee no, without taking the amendment. And that's that. something but, but the I mean, author's office. But if we're sponsoring it and we're in and they take us out, then and we might be in an awkward position, but they took us out. Well, if if we if this is the sword we want to die on, we can say, okay, we won't move forward with the other provisions because it's all or nothing. Jenny. So, sorry, can I add something real quick to that? But before I state CPHA's position, uh, um, I, I had heard, heard at the Capitol that um, one of the reasons that that provision was taken out was that if they felt more appropriate that this, that the actual adding of medications would be better suited for uh, the Joint Sunset Legislative Re Review Committee that you guys have to go through every so often, and that that would be the place to decide whether you should or shouldn't do that. That's different than than kind of what's being talked about. I know that that reason that I just mentioned is was one that I had heard um, uh, because I, I was asked, uh, um, you know, what what's the board's position on that? I said, well, I, they're the sponsor, so. Um. You know, um, back uh, going back to promethazine with codeine, which is probably the most abused drug on the streets today. Right. And so up until, up until whichever bill it is, so it wasn't included in cures. Yeah. Right. And so I, I believe it was this board that, that brought that to the attention of those who needed to know, and now it's uh, the fives are going to be Right. And I, I'm not saying that, that we support or oppose. I'm just saying that that's what I had heard yeah, uh, yeah, from but, the legislature. But, I mean, this whole thing about I mean, we're in the trench, literally, about what's going on and what's happening. And, and promethazine with codeine is a perfect example of us being in the trench. We go to pharmacies, and they're, they're missing, you know, hundreds of pints and and, and we hear about uh, irresponsible physicians and, and 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 pharmacists and we deal with it but this is where the action is when it comes to drugs that are being abused mm -hmm. <clears throat> I can understand the medical board mm -hmm. uh, and I can understand their reasoning to some degree right. but to eliminate us when we're in the trench uh, just seems to be um, 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 short-sighted I was looking for understand an um, and word. <laughs> going back to CPHA's position uh, we have a supportive amended position on this um, we are looking for amendments two specific amendments number one um, the ICD 9 and 10 codes uh, were removed from this bill uh, through I believe the Department of DOJ or the DOJ who, who requested the removal of those codes and we'd like them to be put back in and secondly uh, I know that there's a there is concern from our pharmacists about uh, requiring a 24-hour upload to, to the Cures database, and we had explained that the process of uploading uh, these, these prescriptions wasn't as simple as just putting them in a computer and there it is. Um, there's a whole process involved, and I mentioned some of this yesterday at the Ledge Reg Committee. Right. Um, the DOJ uh, goes through a third-party vendor who then has to perform all these tasks before it gets uploaded into Cures. And to to have a 24-hour reporting requirement is is a little bit worrisome that that we won't we physically wouldn't be able to comply with that now having said that between yesterday and today i understand that we're working on that issue and that um you know we're, we're gonna try and work with uh uh the doj and 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 Ginny as well to to see where we can come to a a, a good compromise as i think there's a some clarity needs to be put in th into there because the intent, if the intent is to just get it uploaded, and that's, I think that's fine for a, a lot of our pharmacists. Um, but the the time requirement, just it, it's not clear whether it's the 24-hour upload to cures, which at this point is not physically possible once you enter it, or whether it's actually submitting the data to the third party. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that, um, but at this point we're we're supportive amended and certainly support the intent of the bill. Thank you, Danny. Okay, uh, AB 2086, uh, this bill will allow pre prescribers to request a list of patients for whom they are listed as being the prescriber in the CURES database. Um, the uh, board was the originator of the bill, uh, and um, yesterday, or yeah, in Ledge Reg Committee, we took a position uh, to recommend support. So this is our action item. Do we have any public comment? Uh, so the committee makes a motion to support this bill. 
do I? I guess I don't need a second. The committee, the committee, exactly. Right. Okay. All in favor? All in favor? Opposed? I couldn't see anybody. It looks like it's unanimous. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't okay. see anybody. Thank you. AB 2783, hydrocodone combination products <coughs> schedules. Um, this would reclassify uh, specific hydrocodone combination products as Schedule II controlled substances. This is the board's measure that was initially intended to reconcile California state schedules with the federal schedule as approved by the board at its January 11, 2018 meeting. Although this bill doesn't go all the way, the change does begin, uh, begin the reconciliation. And uh, yesterday the committee recommended to support, so that is our committee motion. Um, I guess we can vote. Well, uh, public we comment. Public maybe. comment, but I think. Are you voting? No public comment. Okay. All those in favor of support? Okay. Uh, that's everybody. Okay. It passes, moving on. AB 2789, uh, electronic data transmission. Uh, this requires by January 1, 2021, that all prescriptions issued by licensed prescribers in California be issued an electronic transmission prescription. By January 2000, 2021, all pharmacies, pharmacists, or other practitioners authorized to dispense or furnish a prescription must have the capability to receive an e-prescription. Um, and yesterday in LEDREG, the committee recommended support, so we have a motion to support. Do we have any public comment? It's our bill, right? Yeah, it is our bill. It's still our bill. Uh, CPHA is happy to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Excuse me, ladies first. <laughs> Good afternoon. Mary there. Staples with the National Association of Chain Drug Stores, also representing the California Retail Association. And we are very supportive of this um, legislation, e-prescribing throughout the country. We hope that it would have been broader than just limited to electronic prescribing of controlled substances. It's all drugs. It is still all drugs? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, good. And we hope you can continue <laughs> to do that because I know many states are having to pair back and we think it's, it's necessary it's to have it for all. We um, got one of the amendments and we're appreciative that you, you handled the NCPDP script standard issue, but we would like to see uh, a little bit of enforcement teeth in, put into this bill and that we're asking for an amendment so that the board would have uh, to report back to the legislature in 2022 that it is being um, it, uh, it, it adhered to by prescribers. We're finding in states like Minnesota where they mandated it, but they didn't have any enforcement authority, uh, any teeth in their legislation, they really have not implemented it. Whereas mm -hmm. in states like New York State and others where they there are um, uh, provisions in it that licensing board can take action if it's ignored by the prescribers then uh, we see a really strong uptick and uh, and it really cuts back on fraud and abuse in the system so we would encourage you that you consider some sort of oversight down the road uh, and we Mary, be happy what, to work with you on what that. what are the other states what are, what actions are they taking these other states they have the licensing board look at it and so um, if they see that, I mean, you do have the exceptions in them, that's good, but if they see that there's a pattern where prescribers are ignoring it and they're just doing paper prescriptions, they'll bring them before the board and ask them why they're doing that prescription, and they have the authority to take some sort of disciplinary action. So like the medical board? Medical board, the dental board, whatever board yeah. is that licensee. The way our bill is written, the, the, first, the first deadline is for people to have the technology to be able to e-prescribe, and then a year behind that, they have the requirement to do it, to actually mm -hmm. activate it. So the goal is to get the technology in place first. Now, time-wise, a 2022 date doesn't work so nicely with our sunset review date, which is 20 or 2024. We're on every four-year cycles. My first preference would, of course, be that give us six years before our next sunset, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I don't know. Do, how does the board feel about that? I mean, it could clearly be a sunset issue without it being much of an issue for us. 
it's more a curiosity of how we can identify prescribers that are compliant or not compliant with the technology. That would put a burden on the other boards to somehow assess their their individual practitioners. And I don't know how you know that short of a survey of them. Wouldn't, wouldn't this be part of our normal inspections uh, that we would inspect for something like this? We don't inspect prescribers' offices, though. This is. The, the pharmacy piece, we can identify those right. that are compliant. We already know the bulk of them are already are, it's at least in California in the Mary, high 70s. Mary, do you know what they've done in other states? Well, we can work with you on a specific language because I know I, uh, Iowa just signed into law, I think it was yesterday, a very good law that is for all um, prescriptions. And so there are other states, I mean, there are now 10 states with laws on the books. And there are several that have good enforcement penalties should it be ignored. And so we would like to work with the board and can do that very quickly to come up with an amendment just to put a little more teeth into this bill. And how the prescribers feel about that in the states where they've implemented it, in, for example, in Iowa? Well, the prescriber boards in particular. <laughs> so, yes. yes. I, I can't speak directly to Iowa because I, I don't um, work in that particular state. Uh, in s some states, the prescribers are, are on board. Other ones, no one likes the word mandate. So it just varies state by state as most issues do. I think it's going to be difficult for us to initiate right. a, uh, uh, something that would require uh, the other professional boards to act. Uh, I think that it's, they're on their own on that, you know, the other professional boards to deal with their licensees. But I think for us to include that would be a real wrench in the works. Okay. Valerie well, has I, something to say. Valerie. Well, I know that you had a um, question how we can implement this. Isn't there regulations for EHR where all providers have to be electronic health records by a certain date? Can't this kind of coordinate or correlate with it as part of the um, transmitting of prescription through e-prescribe? I don't know what electronic health record deadlines are out there. So Perhaps the meaningful use standards. Okay, and when did those kick in? Oh, those have been in, uh, in place for a while. She's right. It may just it may not apply to maybe these are just private doctors' offices that may not fall under that, but I thought meaningful use actually was for billing, right? I mean they have to have it. I think she's right. Well, okay. Yes. Yeah, so there are, and I believe it's coming up within the next year or two, where all providers do need to have electronic health records and meaningful use, which means that they have to store their records on a cloud. They can't have paper um, records anymore, and that's a federal, if I'm under, um, if I'm not mistaken. And so, for example, in like our practice in optometry, we have EHR, which we can do e-prescribe because it's all part of the portal and the the practice management that we have assigned. So that might be a way to kind of start to regulate and see how we can just interact with those types of programs that are now being approved and provided for different types of medical pro um, offices. Great idea. Mm. Let, let's do a little exploration. If we can do this, would the board be interested in attempting to work with the author? Because the author is going to have to determine whether or not he wants to go in this direction. It might be and good just to look at. Dentist, so it might be good to look at the timelines for the meaningful use yeah, that Valerie is mentioning and have them consistent. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's exactly point. what I was thinking. Well, yeah, I mean that, and then also look at what other states have done. Because I agree, we don't want to put something in a place that's basically going to not have any traction, mm -hmm. or worse yet, kill the bill. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but 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 I I hear the value. Sometimes you need a little incentive yeah. to get you to move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We'll Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Okay. So. Um, uh, can I comment. get one more second? Uh, oh yeah. I just wanted to well, see. Well, you were so nice to wait. I just I figured you're, you're yeah, not please. Talk. Did you see my cufflinks? No. All right. I still can't see them. I Order and pestle. Oh, yeah. very good. I can pick that out at all. I like that. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Has nothing relevant to the uh, testimony. It, I rarely ever stay for this section, and I'm glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in favor of the prescribing, and it would be a blessing for everybody, and it would, um, I'm, so I'm a big fan of it. Um, but we have, in my practice, so I'm glad that I'm here, we have come across an issue where some states and I'll explain my issue, is that some states have actually carved out exceptions because of unique particular prescriptions or therapies. And in particular, 
most of the e-prescribing programs that I have researched, I do not know them all, is that they can only accommodate one controlled substance. Hmm. And in the nature of parenteral therapy, there may be more than one controlled substance. And so the software packages that we've examined cannot accommodate that. And so in, Cal uh, in New York, they went all e-prescribing, and I'm, I'm not touting them at all, but there was a carve-out regarding particular therapies, and in my work, intrathecal drug therapy, where you may have more than one controlled substance involved. And so I want you to take consideration is that there may be, and I don't want to carve out, because I would love to go, that, and I'm researching right now with programmers to see if we can accommodate, and you, know, you can probably imagine only one NDC number or one controlled substance. Uh, is it looking for more than one controlled substance and data that can be done? I, I assume it can be done. I'm in the microcosm of the world of uh, uh, parental uh, long-term pain management, but it is something that, uh, at least New York, they carved it out and they went to paper prescriptions. I would love to figure out a way to do this. I'm just asking the board to consider this. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, as I mentioned, the uh, committee has a motion to support, so we need a vote. Well, the committee made the, we don't need a second, right? We just No, we don't need a second, we just need to vote. All so. in favor. But we're, we're doing that with the understanding that, Jenny, you're going to talk to the author. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to see if there's a way we can put in the meaningful use um, tag because if we're already moving, and that would explain why there's no, virtually no opposition to the bill, too. That kind of explains it, that, that everyone's already moving in this direction. But. Well, I, I've noticed uh, the doctors that I know, um, the younger ones are using e-prescribing now. The older ones are not. So uh, not to say anything about my generation, but uh, <laughs> you know, they, they just don't seem to be doing it. However, hopefully they will get on the bandwagon soon. Uh, Anyway, the next group is legislation impacting the practice of pharmacy or the board's jurisdiction. First bill, uh, AB 1753. Uh, 1753 is, uh, it would limit the number of authorized security printers uh, approved by the DOJ to three effective January 1, 2020. The committee took no position on this. Um, the question, we voted it down last time because we didn't understand why they selected three. Now we still don't understand why they selected three, but we were told that the Department of Justice is the ones who did it. So, do we have any? California, three printers. Yeah, three print. Well, to get it down to three, because right. anyway, we didn't take a position on it. Uh, and uh, do we have any public comment? No. Board comment other other than the surprise question from staff. <laughs> okay, moving right along. AB 1953. Uh, that was 1953. What's that? That was 1950. Oh, so, sorry, that was 1753. That sorry. was 1753. This is 1953. Sorry. Okay. This bill would require disclosures by an applicant for a license to operate a skilled nursing facility or by a skilled nursing facility licensee relating to an ownership or control interest of 5% or more in a corporation, sole proprietorship or partnership that provides or is proposed to provide any service to the skilled nursing facility. Uh, the board staff recommends that amendments be offered to require a similar disclosure by anyone applying for a pharmacy license the additional provision would support the intent of the legislation by also highlighting any relationship between a pharmacy and a SNF. Um, the uh, committee um, took a supportive amended position. It was supportive amended to require similar disclosure to the Board of Pharmacy, which is what the staff recommended. So do we have any public comment? Um, so CPHA doesn't have an official position on the bill. However, um, we'd like to note our somewhat um, tepid concerns about what the what the amendment actually looks like in the language. And as I mentioned yesterday at the at the committee, we we're going to hold off on taking a position until we actually see what language the board comes up with, uh, right. and then reassess that. Okay. Thank you, Danny. I have a question. 
So are we opposed to a pharmacist owning a, uh, uh, some percentage in a skilled nursing no, facility? No, we're, we're just talking about it. We're, we want it disclosed. I know disclosing, but yeah. I, I understand disclosing, but for why are we disclosing? What's uh, the purpose? The, what's the ultimate purpose? <clears throat> we have had cases where the skilled nursing facility is also owned by a pharmacy that is also owned by a wholesaler, and there's been a lot of fraud. So we're hoping that the disclosure will just allow us to look into it. It does not mean by any stretch of the imagination is not, it is not um, eliminating them from the, the possibility of a license. It's really just a disclosure so that we are aware. So we don't look at it as being a conflict if Stan, from Stan's drug, that supplies Debbie's uh, skilled nursing home is an owner in Debbie's skilled nursing home. So, so I mean, is there a conflict there that the board perceives to exist? When we ha we have had a very significant case, and there's, well, that's what that's what I'll say. That that you all have a, you have already resolved that involved significant fraud. Um, and it was to the detriment of the patients in the skilled nursing facilities. And in this specific case, the pharmacy owner owned um, a wholesaler as well as several skilled nursing facilities in California was not required to disclose that. All we're trying to do is get the disclosure at the application point so that we're aware. Good. Thank you. Paige. Um, Paige Talley, CCAP. And as I spoke yesterday, I agree with uh, CPHA that we haven't taken a position yet either, of course, but um, we would like to see the amendments and we would not object to disclosure if, if you can if find fraud in that. Yeah, right. so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so. Support of amended vote. 20, wait a minute, 1953, 2037. We didn't do it, I guess. Okay. 2037. Oh, Mr. Excuse Lippie, would it be go? possible to get a vote on that one? ABC, could you we get a vote on, on that position, please? 17. Uh, 1953. Right. SIA. Yeah, okay. <coughs> we, uh, yeah, the committee recommendation or the committee motion is to support, if amended, to require similar disclosure to the Board of Pharmacy. All those in favor? Everybody. Okay, it passes. Uh, next is 2037, and uh, this would allow a pharmacy to provide pharmacy services to outpatients in an entity covered under Section 340B through the use of an ADDS. Um, measures similar to last year's SB 528, the board established a supportive amended position on that measure. As part of its request, the board requested that provisions not be limited to just 340B clinics. The board's amendments were not incorporated into the measure last year, and the ult measure ultimately stalled in committee. Um, we uh, direct staff, yeah, we didn't take a position other than we directed the staff to work with the author's office to reconcile it with SB 1447. Because we've already got a bill on the, yeah. the board sponsor. 1447 already kind of does it. So do we have any public comment or not? Nope. Okay. Okay. Next is AB 2138. And uh, that would replace or would place significant limits on the board's enforcement process, including limits on when a board can deny, revoke, or suspend a license based on a conviction or other act, and limits on the length of probation. It also limits the board's time frame to decide on a petition to modify probation to 90 days. And uh, the staff's comments are that uh, staff has significant policy concerns that the measure will negatively impact the board's ability to thoroughly review and consider criminal arrests and our convictions of applicants and licensees. And um, the committee uh, motion is to oppose this uh, bill. Do we have any public comments? What are, what are the uh, author's motives here? To tell us what we can and cannot do. Well, I think it's to make sure that you don't have a lifetime ban against entering a profession that you may either love or want to be in or you 
you may have been in at one point and that five years is long enough, I suppose. I, I, I think that there, it's just viewed as a bar to your future success and happiness. I was reading something that kind of indicated something along that line somewhere. Seems extraordinary. Um, we, there are actually two similar bills for that. Really? Yeah. Were you going to add anything? Are they ours, or there's two oh, summer yeah. bills uh, impacting other boards? Oh, it's all board. It pretty much hits occupational licensing. Um, so CPHA has no position on this. Uh, I just wanted to provide further clarity. So the authors for this particular measure are people who are interested in uh, uh, getting people who have been previously incarcerated back to work, and some of those may include some of your licensees. Um, this is not directed just at this board. This is directed at all uh, healing arts boards, and so uh, it's part of like a major social justice reform yeah. package uh, that they're pushing. Um, the next bill, which I believe is the Kylie bill, we also don't have a position on, um, is more, uh, I, I happen to know people in that office, that's a, uh, a, a bill that um, it tries to implement a right to work um, uh, sort of model that uh, a lot of libertarian groups have, have been advocating nationwide and believe that licensing is, is a... Uh, is a barrier to actually get people who have a right to work. So just uh, the more libertarian leaning, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so I just I, CPHA is providing no position on this. I just happen to know this and w wanted to share it with the board. Are you surprised that CPHA doesn't have a position? I'm sorry. Are you surprised that CPHA doesn't? Have a position? <laughs> um, Whoa. And when did you stop? I I have no comment, oh Mr. Weiser. Oh my. <laughs> see, see, Danny, so, you speak enough, you finally get hit. Hey, so Greg, did, did we have a position on this? Well, yeah. we have a proposed we're, position we're now. It. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so let's vote. All those opposed? All those in favor of the opposed, yeah. Yeah, all those in favor of the opposed position. Thank you. We Thank you. We will be gentle because one of our authors is the co-author of this bill. Uh, well, you be gentle. We're opposing it. <laughs> Kylie. I'll bring you with me. No, Greg. that's not Kylie. That's, uh, <laughs> no, but we're going to Kylie. Yeah. Right? Just well, a little no, education for the author, I think. We're going to uh, I, we won't Santiago the first. first. Take this position. Yeah. Uh, the next one's actually not Kylie's. It, it's 2256, and this is Santiago. And it's uh, to allow law enforcement agencies throughout the state to acquire naloxone from a pharmacy without a prescription if it is exclusively for use by employees of the agency who have completed training in administering an opioid antagonist and acquisition and disposition records are maintained by the law enforcement agency for three years. Um, the uh, committee uh, voted uh, to support. And um, do we have any public comment? Well, wait a minute. You have a board member comment. Go ahead. Uh, well, I like the public. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, is there a reason why the law enforcement needs to get it from a pharmacy and they couldn't get it from, like, directly from a, another source or a wholesaler or whatever? Well, well a wholesaler, yeah, a wholesaler As couldn't I, get Just because I used to oversee this for L.A. County, the, you, need, you need to find a physician or someone with a DA number to purchase drugs for you. Wholesalers can't just distribute to a non -licensor. Okay, so they could, so they, that's if, so you have to have a, in order to get it from a wholesaler, you have to have a DEA license, mm -hmm. but get it from mm -hmm. a pharmacy, you don't. Mm -hmm. With a this bill. pharmacy is it viewed more as between the wholesaler and the customer. They have and to so, have an account. pharmacies are located everywhere they're set up to provide medication. To me, it seems like a reasonable way to disperse it short of going to the wholesalers. And the wholesalers opening this up, they might, what, I don't know. What they do now, Debbie, like I, we used to do this for LA City, they, they have a physician that, that they work with, they use the physician's DA number so they can purchase the drugs. Which I think they already can do. They, already they can, can do, do that, that right way. now. So And so this just makes it easier for them. Right. right, they can go to a pharmacy and get the drugs as opposed mm -hmm. to having a physician or mm -hmm. some other healthcare practitioner or some other method. Mm -hmm. yeah. We obviously want to make it easy for anybody to get naloxone, so uh, go ahead. With that, uh, CPHA enthusiastically supports this bill. I'll, I'll also note that uh, this bill passed Appropriations Committee on Consent and is recommended for the consent calendar for Monday's uh, floor session. Thank you. Mary? 
Mary Staples with the National Association of Chain Drug Stores, also representing the California Retail Association, and we are very much supportive of this measure. I think it's a great tool to fight opioid abuse. Thank you. Okay, so let's have a vote. Uh, all those in, f in favor of supporting this bill? Unanimous. Yep. Passes. Okay, uh, next is AB 2409. This is the Kylie bill. Also designed to tell us what we can and cannot do. <laughs> uh, it establishes the right of a person to engage in a lawful profession without being subject to an occupational regulation that imposes a substantial burden on that right. Included within this right is the right to not have the person's criminal record, delinquent taxes, or student loan payments be used as grounds for an automatic denial of a license. It authorizes a person to petition a board to review an occupational regulation for compliance with the above rights. Authorizes a person with a criminal record to petition a board at any time for determination whether the person's criminal record will automatically disqualify the person from obtaining a license from the board and would specify the criteria a board is allowed to use in making the determination. The staff's comments are that the bill failed Assembly BNP, but it's going to be reconsidered. That's why we're talking about it. Board staff have, cons have concerns that establishing a statutory right to a license is counter to the board's consumer protection mandate. Staff notes that last year the board was successful in negotiating an amended amendment to changes in the Deferred Entry of Judgment program by excluding some of the provisions from applying to healing arts licensed professionals. Board staff suggests that similar amendments be requested and if not accepted, the board change its position to an opposed position. Um, and what we did at committee was we took an opposed position. Yeah, I was going to say, so that implies that we have a support position on the... Uh, yeah, apparently we had a, uh, either a support or a uh, pose and less amended. So, uh, may, yeah, may I clarify? I think it was a pose and less amended. Yeah, the staff was suggesting yeah. in the OUA the committee decided to go with, a with an outright oppose. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it just says that it was From a pose and less amended to a pose. So what the intent was was to allow staff the flexibility to change it if they didn't accept it without coming back to the board for approval to change it from an OUA to an oppose if they did not accept our amendments. So actually, we made a mo our, our motion is was just to oppose. to oppose, period. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Which is where we're sit. Any public comment more than what Danny already said? We just give okay. Them. All those in favor of opposing? They could use no, the oppose, period. This is for oppose, right? Yeah, we yes, already have an opposed and less amended. We're changing it to oppose. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. AB 2576. Uh, AB expands the emergency provisions to authorize a clinic license by the board to purchase drugs at wholesale for administration or dispensing to patients to furnish dangerous drugs or devices in reasonable quantities without a prescription during a federal, state, or local emergency. The board currently has authority to issue temporary permits as well as a process to waive certain requirements in the event of a declared natural disaster. Many of these provisions currently only apply to a pharmacy. It appears that allowing greater flexibility for clinic licenses would be consistent with the board's policy of ensuring displaced patients have ready access to prescription medications. Uh, board staff provided technical input to reconcile the provisions with the current law. Uh, committee's position is to support, so that is the committee's motion. Public comment, or board comment? No. Danny. Um, CPHA uh, supports this bill as well. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of support? It's unanimous. Next is AB 2859. It requires community pharmacies that dispense uh, schedule two, three, or four controlled substances to display safe storage products within the pharmacy. Um, 
what this means is that there are bottles that uh, are, cons are considered safe to store your abuse potential medicines in, and they want to make it uh, necessary for pharmacies to carry these and to display them. <coughs> and uh, as was discussed in committee yesterday, these are not tamper-proof. They could easily be broken into. And what this is doing is it would mandate pharmacies <laughs> to purchase these and display them. It <coughs> makes no sense to us. Danny knows all about it. But Danny? Oh, unfortunately, about yes. It um, so, correct. So the safe storage product uh, bottles are, there, there's several different types. The, the sponsor of this legislation is one of the manufacturers, and, and this particular manufacturer has a bottle with a combination lock on top of its, uh, on, on, the, on the top, and it can only be opened with the correct combination. Unless uh, you smash it. Unless you smash it, unless you cut it with a hacksaw, unless you nuclear bomb it. I mean, there's a, a couple ways. And actually, I uh, forgot to mention this yesterday. Uh, there's a backup key that you can actually put into this bottle if you happen to forget the combination. So but I think you also said you could you open it with a paper clip. Yes, some well, not this for, not this particular bottle, but there are other bottles oh, that okay. uh, the people have actually broken into with paper clips that require a small key. Those are carried by Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> Office Depot. Right, there you go. So, um, I, before so that's that's kind of the, the the impetus um, if there're no more board comments uh, I may uh, continue. So CPHA um, has been trying to work with uh, some of Member Caballero on getting to a place where we can all agree to be happy. Unfortunately, that has not happened. Um, so unfortunately, CPHA is at an opposed position with this bill. Um, one of the things that we've alerted the, the author to is that really there is no study to show that these actually work. I mentioned yesterday during the Legislation Regu Regulation Committee that the manufacturer's office is literally down the street from our, from our office. And, uh, you know, <laughs> um, I actually have a sample of one of these bottles in my office uh, just because I thought it was, uh, they, they provided it to me so we can, we can actually see it. Um, but the bigger concern that we have is is this is this would create an unprecedented uh, law to where they're requiring pharmacists to purchase a product that has absolutely zero guarantee that it sells, and um, we've tried to get exemptions for for independence. I know, and, and I mean, uh, Mary's here, so she may speak on the chain side. But for independence, this would be a major cost issue. Um, each one of these bottles averages from seven to fourteen dollars a piece. The bill is silent on how many they should be carrying, where they should be carrying. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, we've tried very, very hard to work with the author to get to a place where we can be happy. Unfortunately, we did not get there. So uh, at this point, I'm requesting that uh, the board take an opposed position as CPHA has. That, that, that thing's uh, not reusable, only usable one time only, huh? No, the, no, so they are reusable. So um, uh, it's just, just think of it as any normal prescription pill bottle. Um, except that it has some sort of locking mechanism in place. So, uh, and, and if actually, if, if I can make this, this uh, editorial comment coming from me only, the, the issue that the manufacturer has right now is that they haven't been able to get the word out that this actually exists. And so um, this is more of a marketing issue for them. And we've tried to alert them to different ways to be able to, to get their, their message out. They do currently sell this product on their website. I'm not sure if they sell it anywhere else. What's uh, the name of it, Dan? Um, I, you'll forgive me. I, I can't remember at this point. I can, I can certainly uh, look it up and get back to you on that. But, um, oh, so, yes, yeah, SafeRx, correct. SafeRx? SafeRx. Now, would, would a CPHA be opposed if it was an optional stock, like if it would be available upon order? That's what we recommend. That's actually, something that we've considered, and actually well, that's one of the amendments that the author's office uh, sent to us to, to consider is more of a uh, uh, consignment issue where, you know, they would provide X number of bottles to the pharmacy. Uh, based on what they sold, they would pay a percentage, and then on the un unsold ones, yeah, they would pay, uh, pay them back. But the way the, the bill was written, the language was written, was really, really sloppy, and we didn't, didn't really kind of get to that goal. Um, it's again something we consider. It's this bill is uh, you know halfway through or almost halfway through the process. Um, we consider anything right now, but uh, as it remains right now, we're opposed. Thank you. Um, the oh, Mary. 
Um, Mary Staples on behalf of NACDS and CRA. We don't have a position at this point, but I do have questions. I'd like further clarification on the board on this and, and would like to work with you. The safe storage products, we're worried about where they're stored. Originally, I'd had a 50-foot requirement from the pharmacy, and that's been amended out, and now it says within the pharmacy department, which we're trying to clarify, does that mean behind the counter, the locked counter, or is that, is, is there a definition in rules or statute that defines within the pharmacy well, counter? This wants department? it to display it. So if it's behind the counter, it's not displayed. This bill is requiring it to be displayed. But, but the problem is that it's going into our code and to us, the pharmacy is the licensed premises of that building. And so accordingly, it basically puts it at least on the counter, if not behind it. And, and so there's an easy way to solve that if you're willing to work with the author on that one and just say within, you know, outside the controlled area of the pharmacy, but within purview of the pharmacy. We, we need to get it from behind the licensed yeah, you just, secured you, you, area. You, you just want to make sure that it's not back there because no one would see it and it would be counter to the purpose of the bill in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, our, our committee motion is to oppose unless amended, and the amendment would be to make it optional. So that, huh? So that. Optional to stock, right? To have to stock right. it in your yeah. pharmacy. Right. So you could avail, you can get it, any one of these devices upon request. Yeah, the feeling was if people want to have it, and, and, you know, and, and the pharmacy wants to carry it, why not? So one more quick comment I'd like to make, if, if, if I may. Um, currently, the way the law is set up right now, absent this bill, uh, being optional is essentially existing law, where you can we're, already do this without having. Really need the legislation. Um, e exactly. And so um, having respect for the committee's position, I, I, I didn't mention that yesterday, but yes, uh, to kind of get what Alan was getting at a little bit is, is this is really unnecessary right now. Um, so um, again, I would ask for an opposed position. Uh, we have a committee motion that says to oppose unless amended, so if we want to change that to oppose, we have to vote down the committee motion first and then make a motion after that. So let's go ahead and vote on the committee motion, which is to oppose unless amended. All those in favor of opposing unless amended? Is it unanimous? You need to. No, it's five. Is it five? Oppose. He wants to. He wants to go against it. One oppose. 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 You oppose. And any abstains? There's. There should be ten of you. Let's do this over. All those in favor of oppose unless amended, raise your hand. Four. And four is eight. All those opposed to oppose unless amended, raise your hand. Two. No, two. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Okay. Um, where am I here? Next one is uh, Nazarian Bill AB 2863. And uh, this bill would limit the amount of health care service plan, health insurer, or pharmacy benefit manager may require an enrollee or insured to pay at the point of sale for a covered prescription to the lesser of the applicable cost sharing amount or the retail price. Yeah. Um, well, the, the committee uh, motion is to support. Um, first, do we have any board comments other than what you just said? Okay. I, any I just public comments? I, I do ha oh. just have one question. Um, it says, this measure seems consistent with the board's consumer protection mandate. Can you explain, because it seems like we're talking about price. Yeah, we are. Why, so how does that um, well, seem consistent with our protection mandate? I, I, I kind of feel like maybe this isn't our, this, this isn't really what we should be, this isn't what we do, we don't do pricing. It's, I don't think your mic's on. 
<laughs> no, this, this, I'm this, glad your mic's on, but I think I just heard a bad no, word. No, no, th- th- this, eth- this is an ethical thing. I mean, essentially, what we're having the pharmacists do is lie to the patient that comes in and, and telling them that they have to have the higher price, the copay price. When, uh, like, I go to uh, Walmart for my $4 prescription, if I went to Walmart and said, uh, you know, I'll have it by copay, it would be $10. Uh, and the pharmacist can't tell me that. And so this allows the pharmacist to tell the patient uh, so they can buy twice as much drug uh, so uh, that... uh, So I understand, um, I mean, I understand that, but I guess I'm just wrestling, is that really a board of pharmacy issue? Yes, it is. It is protecting the consumer and it is protecting the public. No, wait, so... (laughs) It's protecting the consumer. How's that? By not letting him be lied to and ripped off, and we're protecting the profession also by allowing them to tell the truth. They are held by, by contract now, oftentimes, not to be able to tell the patient that they can get it at a lower price. I think that does not speak of pro- no. uh, consumer protection whatsoever. Yeah. All right. I think, mm-hmm. Debbie, as far as protection from a standpoint of drugs, it probably not there. Well, it allows them to buy it is. their prescriptions more than once. Yeah, well. I think no. a lot of patients, it's probably very important because yeah. when you buy them, there's a lower cost. I was on. Sorry. I had one red light. Um, I think it's important that the patient be advised that they have a lower price available to them if, and for the therapeutically <coughs> same product. Um, I think that's part of consumer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think it is. allows a pharmacist to do the ethical it's thing. Right, it, and, it's, and, and it benefits yeah. the patient. Why should the patient pay any more than they have to well, for a drug? The, the committee agreed with you. The committee uh, made a motion to support. Okay. Sorry, Dad. You don't need it. Oh. Go ahead, Dad. Uh, um, CPHA also supports the, uh, this bill sponsored by the Chronic Care Coalition. Um, and I, if, if I may, uh, I think. Just, again, as an editorial comment, I think the, the consumer protection lies in the fact that cheaper meds uh, generally equate to greater access uh, for patients. Unfortunately, what we've seen in, in many of our independent pharmacies is uh, they're entering into contracts with entities that are specifically prohibiting them from telling the patient that they may have a lower price available right. um, and, uh, and face consequences if they actually do so. Um, including and up to uh, termination of the contract with the said entity. Uh, that being said, this is a, a, a measure that's um, um, something that we greatly support and, and we enthusiastically support it. Thank you. Paige. Um, I just want to make a comment that what the um, author and sponsor of the bill told me, that um, they had pulled out the gag order from this bill, all the contracting issues are no longer in this bill. They will be in, they're supposed to be eventually in, <clears throat> excuse me, AB 315. So uh, this is more a clawback, which still, you know, it, it's a benefit to the consumers, but it's not the gag order issue. But the current version of the bill that we're taking position on has the provision in the bill. The gag they may order? be planning on mending, yeah. They, no, they took it out. They did, in the, when? April 11th, because I met with the staffer on the 17th and was talking about the gag order, and she said, oh, no, we took that out. Okay. So the bill says that a health insurer... She should be. She's her on. on. She's on. She's on. The light She's was red. A health insurer or PBM shall not require a pharmacist or pharmacy to charge or collect from from an insured a copayment that exceeds the total submitted charges by the network pharmacy. If an insured uh, pays the retail price instead of paying the cost sharing amount for the prescription medication, that amount shall be applied to the insurer's deductible and out of pocket maximum in the same manner as if the insured had purchased the prescription medication by paying the cost sharing amount. Right, but that's not the gag order. No, right. right. Okay. I just Got wanted to. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Got it. I think a lot of states, too, are looking at this. This isn't the only one. Okay, so we have a motion to support the bill. All those in favor? 
Okay, unanimous. No. No. No? no, no, you have one over here. I guess I can't see opposed. that. Far. All those opposed? <laughs> opposed? None. She, was, she abstained. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're into the Senate bills. SB 1021. This bill would eliminate the sunset date on provisions of AB 339, which added Section 1342.71 to the Health and Safety Code, uh, capping monthly copays at $250 total per patient, preventing discrimination against patients with specific conditions by ensuring that all the drugs for a given disease could not be placed in the most expensive tier, and extending care, extending all protections to plans and. We weren't mad at you, Alan. <laughs> well, maybe just a little. <laughs> and extending all protections to plans in the large employer market as well as the individual and small employer coverage markets. Um, yeah, what it, it eliminates the sunset date on the bill that currently exists, which currently uh, states that they, that currently caps the monthly copays to $250 per drug per patient. Um, this was started w because of all the really expensive drugs, uh, and they felt that it was um, placing undue burden on those who were the sickest. So um, the bill originally, which was AB 339, uh, capped the uh, monthly copay at 250 and what this does is takes away the sunset date. Does anybody pay attention to this? What a 250 max copay? I don't think we've had complaints either. This is outside the area where we regulate physically. Wait a minute. So you're saying that already in statute is that you can't have a copay greater than $250 on any prescription? Per month. Per month. Right. Correct. That's what they're saying. That's Correct. Saying. So, um, it, it was. It came into being in 2015. When uh, when Jenny and I um, discussed this with the sponsors, because we were curious to know who would be enforcing it, the provisions, what they said is they're making they're making permanent the law because there was a sunset date on it, and right. so they're making that permanent. And then they did indicate that we as the Board of Pharmacy will not have any role in the enforcement of the provisions. They believe that it will be done by the Department of Managed Care and the Department of Insurance. Oh, that's good. Well, I guess I once again would think that this is kind of outside of our purview. The, uh, okay. I mean, it, it may be in the books, but who, who I mean, who's going to pay attention to it? Well, again, all, all we're doing is taking off a sunset. I mean, so I would say we would take no position because... Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Well, the committee's motion is to support, so... What is the criteria? What is the criteria for what? Supporting to support. it. The committee voted and determined to support. Well, yeah, but they determined based on what? <laughs> oh, based on the belief that it was a good bill. Don't you think it's outside of our purview? I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily out of it any more than the one we just voted on. Say no more. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so CPHA has also taken a support position, and again, previous with the previous bill, um, lowering or capping copays is is in our eyes equivalent to. Uh, access to meds, which is important in our in our mission. Yeah, but I think CPHA is different than the Board of Pharmacy. I mean, you, you I understand. You, you get into the business aspect. We're I, not. We don't do business. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that in in our shared goals of of consumer, you know, protection, uh, pr protecting patients also includes access to meds. As, in in our opinion, and 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 I, I guess we see that as a as a shared goal among our association and the board. So. Um, with that, I'd, I'd ask for a support position. The original bill came in as a result of um, AIDS patients that had to spend <coughs> tremendous amounts of money to get their medication and couldn't get it unless they did. So this bill was passed to give them access to the drugs they needed 
and to not, um, you know, uh, as it says, preventing discrimination against patients with specific conditions by ensuring that all of the drugs for a given disease could not be placed in the most expensive tier, which those were being so done. Let, let me uh, present a scenario so at least it will confirm to me that I understand what we're talking about. So there, there's a drug, and the copay is $125 for a two-week supply, whatever the drug is and whatever condition it's for. Mm -hmm. So you have to get it twice a month, so you wind up spending 250 bucks a month on the copay. Right. So for whatever reason, the copay goes to uh, 150 bucks for this mm -hmm. very expensive drug. So now the most that somebody is going to pay, or the least, is going to be $300 a month. Now this drug is on a formulary, and that's, it comes from PBM. PBM puts it on a formulary, mm -hmm. and that's where, the, that's where the copay is determined for a lot of reasons, and one is overutilization. <clears throat> so would this cause the... PBM not to put it on a formulary and not have it available because they can't keep the the the, the copay at two fifty a month, and so the copay is three hundred a month. That's the best the PBM can do. That's the best the manufacturer can do when it comes to working out the pricing. So instead of it still being available to everybody, it's available to nobody in that plan because of this copay issue. So we may be saying in effect well, we're making it available to those that can't afford it. Uh -huh. But what we're also saying is the PBM decides to take it off the formulary, and this is on a formulary because we're talking about co-pays, we're making it unavailable to those that can't afford it or they're going to have to pay full retail. So it's going to come off of an insurance I think plan. I think the other factor to remember, too, is that there's a lot of manufacturers that are now issuing coupons to help with co-pays. So if a drug is really expensive, they'll give the patient a coupon. I mean, it, essentially, the whole system is paying more money. Well, so recently there was a law use. against those coupons uh, that was just enacted this just, year. Just for the – there's a generic available. Correct. But you can still do brand name coupons. Correct. But it's – it's Right. And, right. And well, got something to so say. I, I'm sorry. The measure was just amended. Would you um, – if the committee is agree and the board is agreeable, would you allow staff? If I'm trying to look at the amendments right now. It looks like it's not going to be doing the same thing as before. It looks like it's maybe taking an alternative approach as my quick scan. Okay. It looks like they're going to be changing um, deductible well, copay amounts and, and things like that. Bill. I think um, yeah. if we could bring it back to the next board meeting, if that's okay. I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. We, yeah. So we're not going to take a position. Yeah, right so now. no right. position. Let's just okay. pass on it for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll just wait here for the next one because. <laughs> oh, okay, you're right. Can't wait. Okay, next one's uh, 1109, and uh, the measure contains provisions relating to education of opioid use, specifically related to our board. It would require a warning label on all Schedule II controlled substances. Uh, the bill was recently amended in committee, and the resulting amendments have not been published. However, the amendments will remove the requirement for the board to promulgate emergency regulations regarding an opioid warning label, as well as no longer requiring the minor and parent guardian to sign a statement upon being informed of the risk of opioid use, rather require a consultation by the prescriber and requiring the use of the opioid fact sheet by the Centers for Disease Control by schools and sports organizations. The problem that was brought up in the committee was that by putting the warning label on, it uh, makes it easier for those who would want to steal uh, these types of substances to identify where they are. Um, so that being said. Well, that's a good observation. It really is. Yeah. Think yeah. about it. You're just walking into a pharmacy. I got to go look for all the warning labels. Those are the ones that I'm going to steal. Right. Plus, in a medicine cabinet from a, yeah. mm -hmm. your yeah. grandmother. Yeah, the kids go in the cabinet. Oh, boy, look at that red label. I want that. <laughs> yeah. And, and really the whole focus, I think we talked at the committee, is that the, what's re you're really going to get the most impetus is by counseling the patient, not by giving them a little warning label or a piece of paper they're going to throw out. Correct. So um, this is another bill where, unfortunately, CPHA has tried to work with the author. Uh, Senate Republican Leader Bates is a wonderful human being. I've had the opportunity to work with her in previous capacities. Unfortunately, we could not get to a position where we agree, so we are officially opposed to this bill. 
Um, one of the things that we've mentioned to her office is that, frankly, the, the, the portion of this bill, because this bill has multiple layers, the one affecting pharmacy in particular, um, re requiring this label, uh, is frankly unnecessary. And we provided a, an example to the author's office. The FDA requires that patient package inserts, PPIs, uh, be included with many prescription medicines. Uh, the guides address issues that are specific to particular drugs, drug classes, and they contain FDA-approved information that can help patients use the medicine safely and effectively while trying to avoid serious adverse effects. So we handed a specific PPI to the author's office, and we made note that in the very first box of this information, it says, an opioid pain medication that can put you at risk for overdose and death. Even if you take your dose correctly as prescribed, you are at risk for opioid addiction, abuse, and misuse that can lead to death. So um, I'm not sure if they were aware that this was there as part of existing FDA regulations, but uh, we've, we've informed her of this, um, and, and we have not heard anything from her office since, and so we unfortunately must oppose this bill. Thank you. Yeah, just to echo what was said earlier, Caitlin Patel, pharmacist with Kaiser Permanente. Um, Kaiser also opposes for the reasons stated in committee. Um, you know, patients are being followed to consultations and, you know, basically being targeted based on a consultation on an opiate. If you mark a bottle with something like that, it's just as bad, if not worse. So we oppose. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Um, Lippi, Mr. Lippi, um, as part of the motion, um, the committee um, wanted to be clear that the oppose was specific just to the pharmacy piece and not the underlying policy goals of the measure, which was focused on education. Right, and as a result, the committee's motion was to oppose unless amended uh, to address utilizing other alternative markings while carrying on other provisions, including uh, uh, the education to the consumer, because the bill did include education. So we did not take an opposed position. We took an opposed unless amended uh, because of the bill having these educational parts to it also. So the committee's motion is oppose unless amended to address utilizing other alternative markings while carrying on other provisions including to educating including educating the customer, consumer. So all those in favor of the committee motion. So the committee so the bottom line is putting this warning label on. So is that the main thing you would have that that's the main thing that we're opposing. It's not the whole bill, there's a lot of other provisions in the bill. Okay. Yeah. So we're, so we're opposing the warning label. The warning label. Yeah. Okay. And saying that the rest of the provisions are okay. Okay. Vote. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, next is SB 1229. Currently, pharmacists are required to inform a patient orally or in writing of the harmful effects of a drug dispensed by prescription. This bill would require, except as specified, a pharmacist to provide oral consultation before dispensing any opioid medication to a patient or the patient's agent for the first time and prohibit a pharmacist from dispensing the medication if the patient or patient's agent declines the consultation. Never mind, the bill's not moving. Okay. Uh, let me keep on top of this. 1240. Yeah, I know, I just want to make sure. 1240's not moving either. So, we're going to 1254. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this bill would require a pharmacist at a hospital pharmacy to obtain an accurate medication profile or list for each high-risk patient upon admission and discharge of the patient. The criteria for determining whether a patient is high-risk will be established by each hospital. 
Additionally, this measure would allow for this duty to be performed by a pharmacy technician or a pharmacy intern if they have successfully completed training and proctoring <coughs> by a pharmacist and where a quality assurance program is used to monitor competency. Uh, the committee directed staff to review the bill and bring any amendments to the next committee or board meeting, whichever is first. Uh, and if amendments need to be submitted before the next meeting, the staff will send it to the committee chair for review. Is this Rita Shane's deal? Yeah. Well, whatever, whatever it is, we directed staff to review the bill and we didn't take a position. So if somebody wants to take a position here, they can make a motion. Anybody jumping? So we're not going to have a motion. Uh, next, uh, the next bill is not moving either. That's SB 1286. And 1373 is not moving. So we come up to 1442. Uh, the committee discussed, let's see, 1442. Specifies that a pharmacy shall not require a pharmacist employee to engage in the practice of pharmacy unless the pharmacist is assisted at all times by another employee, as specified. The measure recently passed out of the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. As part of the committee's discussion, concern was raised about independent pharmacies and the possible negative impact to such businesses. Um, and then the independent pharmacies, it was amended to take the independent pharmacies out of it. And, um, and hospitals. And yesterday, well, that's our oh. motion. Oh, so okay. um, our motion is to support, if amended, to also exempt hospital pharmacies. Can, can, can I speak on it first? Oh, Please. Okay. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm just um, feeling um, that because of all the uh, pharmacies um, that I, I visit a lot of pharmacies and I've seen uh, pharmacists working alone and uh, we're here for public protection and when you have SB 493, you have corresponding responsibility, you have consultation, that is mandatory. Uh, pharmacists uh, ringing up groceries and over-the-counter items and not being able um, to, I mean, even to go to a restroom, they have to shut the entire pharmacy down. And I just think that this is not, uh, um, this is not a good thing for pharmacists. Employee pharmacists are under a lot of stress and I get a lot of complaints about the fact that they are left alone and uh, with all these requirements, uh, it's just, um, I just think it's just such against public protection. Cheryl, if, if we put a limit and said uh, that this only applies to uh, pharmacies that are filling uh, more than 100 prescriptions per day, would that change your mind? Can I, can I, ask uh, I don't a think it's also? a volume situation, really, because the, you have the flu season, you have different seasons. There's no way to really um, to to be able to. to I mean, because it, still you have to you have vaccinations, you have uh, you have other things that 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 involves time. So I don't think volume should have anything to do with that. Okay, Stan. Well, to... I've got a couple of thoughts and. Uh, first, um, I've always been uh, hesitant to, uh, for the board to get involved in uh, the relationship between an employer <coughs> and employee. Uh, I just don't think we belong there. I think that if a professional feels that they are in a situation where it is dangerous to their patient, that they could do something or say something, and we've there have been other times when I've felt the same way. So, so I feel that, you know, uh, that the individual pharmacist who feels that the situation is unsafe should advocate for him or herself regarding that. Secondly, when, Cheryl, when you, and I respect you and hold you in the highest regard, but when you talk about people that you see on a regular basis 
and, and, and pharmacies that you visit. So I assume that these are people who are represented by an organization that works on their behalf with labor issues. And so, once again, I don't want to uh, get in the middle of what could be a labor issue. I think that if your organization and the members of your organization have issues with their employment environment, that's part of why they're part of your organization and, and you represent them in collective bargaining. So, so I'm, I've got a really mixed emotions about this when, when they have representatives uh, working on their behalf in collective bargaining and then wanting the board to step in uh, as well. So those are my mixed emotions, I guess. I, I think, um, you know, as far as the board, I mean, the board needs to step in because this is about public protection. Um, and that's what our mandate is. So that's why I feel like the board needs to be involved in this. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Song. I'm a, currently a practicing pharmacist in San Diego. And I'm here just to kind of share uh, what my real day is like as a practicing pharmacist in a retail pharmacy uh, in current days. And I'm not here with a fancy lobbyist. I'm just here to just speak um, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> yeah. Plus, yeah, not all lobbyists are fancy either, as a matter of fact. I'm just here to speak from the bottom of my heart what it's really like on a yes. daily basis of working in a pharmacy. At my pharmacy, I can speak that I am alone. Usually about 50 to 70 percent of the time, I can attest truthfully that I know a lot of colleagues who are alone about 40 to 50 percent of the time working by themselves. And I can share during the, um, you know, it's not... Um, you know, in a, during the mi busy day, I can tell you there's a phone ringing while someone is dropping off a prescription and someone wants to buy a grocery item off the counter and someone is waiting in the room to receive their shots as well as doctors calling in the prescription and someone wanting to meet, uh, call the insurance company to get an override for their vacation supplies. And I understand that these are duties and I just want to emphasize I'm not here to complain or vent. I'm just here to share what it really is like working in a pharmacy. Um, I can tell you that we do about 1,000 shots during a flu season. That's about eight to nine flu shots in a given four months period, and I'm a lot of times by myself. And so I have about three people waiting in the room while I have two people coming off the window wanting to drop off their antibiotic prescription, and also someone wanting to ask me what they should take for their cold remedies. This is something that I do truly believe this is for the public safety and protection that pharmacists should be given some form of assistance. We're not asking for technicians, we're just asking some form of assistance that can relieve what we do. And to top it all off with the, in light of SP 493, we're now being given more responsibility, which we are grateful for what we get to do. We get to give birth controls and travel medications and immunizations, and we get to give life-saving naloxones, and we get to do all kinds of other stuff. But there's just not enough help and there's not enough adequate resources for us to really perform these duties well. Um, and to top it all off, the current epidemic and opioid crisis going on, we are being given more corresponding responsibilities to do our due diligence to make sure that the prescriptions are right for the right purposes. Oftentimes, I have to get multiple times to get a hold of the physician's office to get the diagnosis code for the narcotic prescriptions. In this day and age, the, the just putting a pills in a bottle for us is, is not here anymore. We are doing more, and we are in need of absolute more help. And to close it off, you know, I think uh, one of the organizations that uh, represents us did a survey, and of the 100 pharmacists that works in a pharmacy system for my organization, 89% of said that they had less time to spend on protecting the patient's interest, and 67% said that they had less time to prevent opioid abuse. 83% said they were to some extent unable to fill prescriptions in a timely manner. And I can tell you from my own experience, I had multiple close calls and I have witnessed multiple times where wrong vaccination was given to patients because we were in a rush to get those out and done. So I do truly believe this legislation is important for the public 
in California, and I do ask your support. I think there are some lobbyist organizations that would hire you right now. <laughs> Can, can I ask now when you when you because I, I kind of agree with Stan that this is an an employer employee thing. What happens when you talk to your employer or and you let them know? Because I'm sure that they probably track if you have your prescriptions out within 15 minutes and they're tracking all those metrics. And if you're that busy, you can't do that. I'm so. absolutely grateful that Stan and you're bringing this up actually because I voice this concern every week. And the response I get is almost a joke. Don't even ask. Hmm. The response you mean like, get me more help? Is that what you're saying? So, and they say, don't, you don't even ask? Uh, don't even ask, yes. Because they Are you rep not. represented by organized labor in any way? I do work for a company that is uh, part of UFCW. Are yeah. you a member? I'm a member, yes. And we do bring those concerns uh, to the company, and that's the reason why we're here asking for 1442 to be passed, because of the fact that uh, not, you know, we have not been, and, and at the end of the day, again, it's about public protection. Uh, we have, and we are going to continue to do what we can about this issue. But at this point, I do feel that this is something that needs to be mandated. How many scripts do you fill a day? We do about 100 prescriptions a day. 100. And during the flu season, more, much more. Plus all the other things. 100 days, eight hour work, or just? Uh, 12 hours. 12 hours. Mm. So what would you do, Albert, if when you're a pharmacist? I mean, you and Victor have pharmacies. What do you, I'd like to get your, your opinion on this. Well, this is well, simply common sense. Like, uh, if you look at it from a business person's point of view, if you want to increase business, obviously you want to staff your help with sufficient help to generate more business, unless you just want to really uh, defer all the customers to other business. So, I mean, I don't know which organization you work with, but obviously the managers are making a smart decision. Well, a Amy, in my pharmacy, I got too many employees. I got too many <laughs> clerk. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I say about and, the independence. And, and I have to schedule them differently. I, I'm scared to, I finally have to schedule them because by, we close at 530. By 5 o'clock, they all ready to punch out. You know, they get all ready. And uh, they standing and around for half an hour, nothing. So... And that's nothing. the difference. So, I so what happens? Uh, I I have them schedule half an hour come early before we open, so they could they could be a little more productive. But if you couldn't provide, that's why the independents have been carved so, out. So, so what 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 Victor says true. I mean, but there are times we have patients lined up almost to the door, to waiting to pick up medicine. So we need those, uh, you know, a high number of uh, uh, cashier uh, or uh, technician. Um, but you know, there's time that we don't need it. But in order to retain the business, we have to have a certain amount of uh, employee to, to, to run the place. And that's what you find in the independents. They're going to do that for the sake of the business. I mean, if I have the, cu I always always tell my employee, I say, if I'm the customer, I walk in there, see a long line like that, I'm gonna walk to the other pharmacy. I mean, I would do the same. So I say, to maintain them, we have to provide a serv service. It sounds like it'd be a business decision. I mean, if you, you, otherwise, if you have long lines and the patients can't be taken care of, they go somewhere else when they have options. All we can do is just try our best, yeah. but we do really want to help our patients, and that is what I think. What I want to bring up is that this is really patient interest. Well, it sounds like if it wasn't a problem, this bill wouldn't be here. Exactly. So That's the main thing. You know. yeah. And I can tell you from my hundreds of my pharmacist friends who share the same sentiment about this issue. But, but at the same time, I would not like the Port of Pharmacy to tell me how to run my business. We're not going to because you're carved out of this. Independents aren't included. Bill? Independents aren't included. Our hospital pharmacy. Who's the sponsor again? Yeah. Um, so CPHA uh, is one of the amendments we sought was to carve out the independents, and, and we got that. So uh, right now we are a supportive amendment, um, understanding that 
while we do have uh, independents in our in our association, we also have folks that that aren't independents and work in for other larger corporations, and and we've heard similar stories to to what the witness has been saying. Right. Um, the only other amendment that we're asking for of the author. Um, and if, if the sponsor would, would, would consider it, is, is for the additional uh, employee to be a tech. Um, and, uh, and that's what, we, what, that's, that's what we're sinking, um, and, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to have conversations on that. Thank well, you. We had a conversation elsewhere about rural hospitals that, uh, that have a single pharmacist working in a rural hospital and, mm -hmm. and the impact that this would have on rural hospitals as well. Uh, they're not included. No, we, not we, included? It was okay, okay, we, we well, actually talked about that, Stan, yesterday because we had some uh, at the legislation committee, some someone who actually raised the issue because some of the hospitals are even struggling with having 24 sur hour services. In our amendment, they're not included. Our yeah. amendment is to support <laughs> amended to exempt the hospital. And, and they're not so bringing up groceries. Rural hospitals would not be affected. So I guess. I have two thoughts. Number one is I'm not really sure why we're um, excluding independent pharmacies. I mean, it seems like if an independent, if a pharmacist in an independent pharmacy is also stretched, unless, I suppose unless if you're the actual owner yourself, but if you're an employee pharmacist in an independent pharmacy, is that really fair that we're excluding them and that we're putting them in that position? Well, it's, it's four because or fewer um, pharmacies. So if they have four or fewer, they're exempt. Yeah. Right. Well, and I guess, okay, great. But so if you, if you only own two pharmacies and you are experiencing the same thing as this gentleman, then why would we, why would we, I mean, if we're really doing this for patient protection, why would we exclude the pharma, those pharmacies? Oh, well, just we're not excluding them. It was amended to exclude it was them. CPHA, we're, we're CPHA to, asked for that amendment, is what Danny it, said. It's already in there, but the reason, I guess, is because they thought. Yeah, I don't know why, Greg. One. It's like there's no microphone around your mouth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, I, uh, the amendment was already made. It's not our amendment, but um, the reason I imagine was that they felt that the smaller pharmacies could not afford this. Whereas, you know, others, larger ones could. So if it's because, because there's a cost, then if, it, if it's an economic problem for a small pharmacy, then, okay, we're going to, I mean, I, I just feel like, you know, a lot lately we need to make sure we're consistent. And I feel like we're just not being consistent here. I agree with Stan that maybe this isn't, once again, this isn't really something that the Board of Pharmacy maybe should be involved in, as it sounds like an employer type situation, but um, I, I just really worry that uh, yet again, we're getting ourselves into something that's not in our, in our sandbox. Well, as um, when I listened to Albert speak about the fact that um, uh, of all the people that he has working for him to, um, as to the reason why he has so many, is, and, the, and the reason why his business is doing as well as it is is because of the help that he will, he will provide. Whereas in uh, the retail uh, chains uh, where they're ringing up the groceries, the pharmacist doesn't have the uh, ability to do anything but to fill those scripts. And, uh, and uh, well, like, I I I would probably will vote against supporting this one because like I say I don't like you know uh, over being over regulated you know uh, it's a supply and demand you know in in this uh, basic economic um, if if those chain store have only one person working and they cannot handle it it's better for us they all come to us and they go to the chain. So, like I say, it's supply and demand. I mean, uh, I mean, if that's the way they want to run their business model, I don't think it's our business as a board of pharmacy to tell them what to do and how to run their business. Okay, Valerie. I want to speak to it as a consumer and then also speak to it as how I would see the consumer protection. As a consumer, I have run across this issue at my local pharmacy at home where there is just a limited amount of resources based on the amount of people that they're attending to in my local community. 
when you look at the larger chains, which I do attend a larger chain, I do see that there is a concern there. And then also I have noticed that there is a lack of professional pharmacists in our area, which have a pretty large demographic area and also would, I would assume, would is protecting and s serving our community, which is would be underrepresented. So when you're looking at a smaller pharmacy, and I can see why the legislation would state that it would omit a smaller pharmacy, is because if there is a an, a cost issue, you have the higher risk of a smaller pharmacy having to close the doors, which will then affect the locations and the the um, the individuals that they're trying the the they will it will affect the communities that they're looking to present, to represent and to serve, which can also then affect the underrepresented communities as well. As a consumer protection agency, I see this as a good asset, which will provide a quality of service, which may be lacking in other areas. Um, again, that's based on just my personal opinion. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Parrish Bauer. I'm the political director for UFCW Western States Council, and I appreciate all of your comments. Um, again, in the committee, uh, we uh, committed to work with the board to uh, make sure that we were exempting hospital um, pharmacies. And I also uh, c really can't have laid out the problem better than our member pharmacists. Um, this is certainly about um, our members, but I uh, echo um, your comments around uh, as a consumer. Uh, what, what we've really based this legislation on is both member data, so we have talked to um, a large percentage of our members. This was not driven by the union, and actually our members begged us to do something because they feel like it's very unsafe for consumers, um, and this, is, this bill is really reflective of that. We actually have several members who come from mom and pop pharmacies um, who, who are now working as floating floaters pharmacies, and they say that they have never, that they are very, very concerned about the way that the retail pharmacy is operating, um, especially with the labor percentage. Um, you know, I think one of our members says that there's more labor allotted to the deli because the deli makes a lot of money than the pharmacy for staff, for staffing ancillary support. Um, so we certainly, uh, I do have a letter from Senator Scott Weiner, um, who is the author of our legislation that I'd love to distribute if I could, and then also he sure. has requested that we read it. Um, so the whole thing? Okay. And we have extra copies. Um, so the first couple paragraphs lays out the problem, which I believe uh, we already have done so. So I would just like to read the second part right here on the second page. Um, we were uh, While I was disappointed to see opposition emerge the afternoon prior to your vote without any advance notice to my office or, or corresponding ability to respond thoughtfully or negotiate amendments, Nobody can dispute the basic facts that this measure attempts to address. It is well established that some pharmacists are left alone during the workday, often for hours on end. Nobody, including the opposition, argues that this is in the best interest for patients. Nor can anyone argue in good faith that leaving pharmacists alone for extended periods of time result in, results in pharmacy practice in, consistent with the board's mission of public protection. That is why the opposition, while making many claims about this bill, does not actually dispute that California pharmacists struggle with a serious problem worthy of legislation. The 11th hour opposition letter offers no reason for the board to decline to support my bill for several reasons. First, as the opposition, opposition concedes, my bill does not define what would or would not be considered assistance. SB 1442 leaves ample flexibility for the board to define what assistance entails, both by regulation, if it so chooses, or on a case-by-case -case enforcement basis. For this reason, it would be illogical to leap into the opposition's unsupported conclusion that pharmacies must close if assistance is momentarily unavailable. The enforcement option postulates in their letter a type of board mandated temporary self-executing automatic revocation occurring in the absence of a formal complaint or investigation. Simply could not occur under the bill as currently written as it does not reflect the reality of how the board <laughs> carries out its responsibilities. By defining assistance, I am intentionally placing my faith in the board and its established procedures which have traditionally matched the gregariousness of a violation to the remedies available. Second, my bill, which will shortly be amended, 
per a previous agreement in the Senate Business and Professions Committee to cover only large chain pharmacies. Consequently, no 24-hour pharmacy is in jeopardy unless the only employee in a CVS or Walgreens is a lone pharmacist. Far from providing a reason to oppose my bill, the existence of such a dangerous and unfortunate situation is the reason I authored SB 1442 in the first place. Finally, my bill is not aimed at addressing the broader and very different question of whether pharmacy technicians or advanced practice pharmacists are more desirable when carrying out specific duties around the pharmacy. A bill does not have to solve all problems to address one, and should future legislation resolve these more holistic issues, I will gladly work with all stakeholders to modify or delete any provisions of SB 1442 that are no longer necessary. In the meantime, however, I will observe only that I feel compelled to act by the stories of pharmacists who simply cannot perform their duties the way you and I would want them to. That is to say, safely. I will also observe that, again, regardless of the broader issues at play, a pharmacy does not necessarily need additional pharmacy technicians simply to answer telephones or ring up candy bars. I respectfully ask that the board endorse SB 1442 and help ensure that pharmacists can give full attention to their state ma mandated duties. Thank you for your consideration and for all of your work on behalf of California patients and pharmacists. Sincerely, Senator Weiner. So. Can I ask you a question about the, the letter? Absolutely. There's yeah. on, on page three, mm -hmm. or page two, sorry. There's um, the second from the last sentence, that's the paragraph. It says, second, my bill will shortly be amended per a previous agreement in the Senate and Business Professions Committee to cover only large chain pharmacies. That's correct. Yeah. What does that mean? So I think it's referencing um, the amendment that was presented um, and that we discussed yesterday, that it will exclude um, both hospital uh, pharmacies and um, small uh, mom and pop pharmacies, four or less. I, I have a question also. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's the next sentence. <coughs> Consequently, no 24-hour pharmacies in jeopardy unless the only employee in a CVS or Walgreens is a lone pharmacist. <coughs> so it's 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. There's a pharmacist behind the counter, mm -hmm. and there's one person at the cash register. Correct. In a 16,000-square-foot uh, store. And he's saying that's okay or it's not okay? It, um, we do not believe that a pharmacy is, should be left alone at any time, even if it's a 24-hour pharmacy. And I realize that. But so, so is what you're saying that it's okay for there to be one pharmacist and one clerk and that uh, consequently no 24-hour pharmacy? As the bill is written, the, f the, the additional support would have to be in the pharmacy so that if there was a clerk at the front of store, I think that's what you're discussing. Yeah, that's actually. I don't, I don't understand what this sentence says. Yeah, I would agree. It sounds like the sentence saying that the pharmacist can be alone in the pharmacy as long okay. as there's somebody else in the store. That is not the intent, um, and we can clarify in a, in a okay. draft uh, around that. But so let me ask you, so if your position uh, was that the only thing that a pharmacist could do would be pharmacy related. So he can't um, uh, check out uh, a box of wheat thins at the pharmacy counter. So I mean, could, could you, could, I mean, wouldn't it be easier to say that all that he could do is pharmacy related stuff? I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like he, and I've yet to see a pharmacist at the checkout counter and I'm, I'm waiting for that day because I think, uh, but, but I've yet to see a, a pharmacist at the checkout counter. And so couldn't you say that the only responsibilities a pharmacist should have is pharmacy-related responsibilities? That is not the intent of the bill. I mean, if he were to be checking out a box of wheat, we want the pharmacist to have adequate staff. Right now, what they're doing is they're doing that regularly as part of their regular job. And they're also being asked to walk the, the, the pharmacy area, what I understand, to, to try to bring customers into the pharmacy. There are other things that they're trying to do. Um, they're cleaning trash out of, the, out of the aisle sometimes because they just don't have enough ancillary support. So while we certainly don't want to prohibit them from ringing up a customer, that happens. Um, but we do want to provide the adequate staff so that they're not trying to fill a prescription and being interrupted um, constantly where there, I, there's more um, uh, possibility for errors. I do clean my own bathroom as well as yes. taking out the trash. Many of them do, right. Because they don't want, isn't it more of a security issue because there's no EVS the, staff the in, around it, drugs? It, no, it's just because no. they don't want to hire people? The bathroom is not in the pharmacy. 
th- th- we have many, many members who have oh. who have mentioned this and even cleaning the area where they give immunizations that's also a problem right because they're often not not cleaned and yeah so over i mean just my opinion on this whole thing i think i agree with valerie it's a good consumer protection i agree with cheryl i just think that to say a pharmacy is a pharmacy is really difficult there's so many different types of pharmacies mm-hmm. that you that to have a blanket um, a, pr- a requirement for everything that calls itself a pharmacy is very difficult. We, we talked about hospital. There's some small pharmacies I know that we have that has maybe, they may fill 50 prescriptions and they do clinical work. Mm-hmm. And putting a pharmacy tech in there may shut down that pharmacy. So there's different... It's in a retail setting? Well, it's, it's remember, the Board of Pharmacy only licenses two pharmacy types. They tie a retail and a hospital. Mm-hmm. So even though if you're in, a, in an outpatient ambulatory right, right. setting, mm-hmm. taking care of patients, and you may fill 10 prescriptions, you're still a retail pharmacy. So there's, there, that's why I, I kind of wondered, is there a way to deal with the whole volume issue? Because I think this may also have an unintended patient consequence in that the smaller sites may feel the pressure to just shut down. Yeah. I, I, Okay, I understand what you what you're saying, um, and I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I will. I mean, there are other. We we have other members in other settings, and we have heard that. Um, you know, if you're working a 12-hour shift, as many of them do, they're not taking breaks. We have uh, female pharmacists who have recurrent UTI infections because they're actually to close the farm. We have counter jumping theft. I mean, there are real issues, even with the retail issue aside. But I, I do hear what you're saying, well, and um, we would be open to working would, on that. With the opioid ep- epidemic, I probably more worry about robbery than uh, the, 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 than the service. Absolutely. When yeah. they serve and, by and themselves. And when you're alone, you're very yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. What do you mean by that, Al- Albert? I mean, if you have, with your only pharmacist, your only employee there, I mean, you know, it's a lot more easier for people to come in and rob yeah. you. And it happens. And on our survey of 100 yeah. members, we had many, many members talk about um, theft, counter jumping, and, and also the process of closing. If I'm not a pharmacist, but I have actually been with a pharmacist who has had to close the whole thing down. It's, fair. it's not easy. You don't right. just like lock the door and walk away. Is there any other public input? Thank you very much. Thank you also for coming. It was very, I'm sorry, your name again? I'm Fong. Fong, thank you, Fong. Thank you. Clean the bathroom. So, um, can, oh, do you want, I don't want to cut off public comment. Can we just comment, hear this last public comment and then we'll yeah. take a break? Yeah. Laura? Thank you. We're just going to take a, a five minute break. Okay, let me. Good afternoon, Mary. Good afternoon. Mary Staples with the National Association of Chain Drug Stores, also here representing the California Retail Association Chain Pharmacies. Um, on behalf of our members, we would ask the board oppose, as we believe this bill poses a direct threat to patient access to pharmacy services and medications. Allow me to highlight a few of the uh, concerns and a different perspective than has been uh, discussed so far today. Um, Pharmacies will be at risk of shutting down during crucial times since the bill does not define assisted every time the situation occurs where a pharmacist does not have assistance in the pharmacy from another employee, the pharmacist must, pharmacy must shut down. This would be incredibly disruptive for patient care. If there is only one pharmacy in the town or near this patient, the patient would be unable to go to another pharmacy nearby for their prescriptions or health care services. And what about when emergencies occur, such, um, such an employee getting sick or suddenly quitting work? Under this bill, the pharmacy would have to cease operations until they can find an employee to assist the pharmacist. This is not good for patient care. The bill does not solve the entire staffing problem in pharmacies. Although the bill would establish minimum staffing requirements, it does not address the very limited pharmacist to technician ratio 
problem that is in this state. For the current pharmacist to technician ratio has remained unchanged for more than two decades, which makes it extremely difficult to provide additional technician assist, uh, assistance to pharmacists. NACDS and CRA. With, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? We're because talking I think we need to look at the bigger picture okay, well, of pharmacy staffing, and a lot of folks have talked. But this 1442 doesn't have anything to do with pharmacy technician ratio or anything at all, does it? it? It is. It has nothing to do with it, and you're ignoring the problem of the ratios that should be a part of it. And that we um, were in discussions earlier in the year with UFCW as a total pharmacy package. But that's not going to address the issues that Fong just mentioned, where he's by himself and he doesn't have anybody. And I think that's what, that, what the whole bill is aimed at doing. Well, we think that this, too, would have unintended consequences and that in 24-hour pharmacies right now that we have open that are convenient to patients and maybe more accessible for people that are on shifts or low-income workers to um, get out outside of normal business hours, pharmacies would have to consider because patient demand at night is much lower that it would be hard to staff it with additional pharmacists. So it would discourage pharmacies from keeping these 24-hour pharmacies open with just a solo pharmacist. So in most of your 24-hour pharmacies, only one pharmacist on duty at night? I, there are circumstances in a 24-hour pharmacies. There are some. Okay. So instead of providing pharmacists additional pharmacy technician assistance and expanding care and patient services, this bill, we believe, would do exactly the opposite. It fails to take into account emergency situations, and it, results, it would result in temporary closings of pharmacies when we don't have employees to assist the pharmacists, and thereby resulting in bad patient care and access problems. So for those reasons, we would ask that you oppose this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Richard Barrera. I'm the secretary treasurer of UFCW Local 135 here in San Diego. And we do represent pharmacists like Song uh, who work in the uh, grocery stores and in uh, Rite Aid and CVS stores. However, I think partly to, um, to Mr. Weiser's comment, there are many retail pharmacies around the state that are not represented. So this is not simply a, an issue that we can address or solve at the bargaining table. We have this conversation at the bargaining table with our employers. There's only so much that we can get done at the bargaining table, but this is a basic public safety issue that we believe is appropriate uh, to be addressed uh, here by the Board of Pharmacy. Th this, is being, this is being addressed to the chain drug stores because that's the larger, and aren't most chain drug stores represented? Uh, no, Walmart, for instance, is a non-union, non? uh, large retailer with a pharmacy. We had earlier, Alan said he gets his, we would discourage him from doing that, but he seems <laughs> to, <laughs> to, get his I wasn't aware. To, okay. to get his prescriptions there. So this, is, this, is a, this affects pharmacies and um, consumers uh, throughout the state of California. And, and to the last comment, I would just say that is completely disingenuous. This bill does not allow for a single pharmacist to say, I'm gonna shut the pharmacy down. This bill is about establishing that retail uh, pharmacy chains uh, do not put pharmacists in a position to be left alone. And if there are issues that arise under this bill, complaints will be brought to you uh, to, to resolve. So the idea that Song or his colleagues would ever just simply shut a pharmacy down um, is uh, certainly not in this bill, and it would never, we would never as a union uh, advise a member to do something like that, and our pharmacists are more responsible than to do that. The pharmacists are taking on their responsibility. The issue is many of the large retail pharmacies are not taking on their responsibility, and this is something that you know, affects public safety, and we would, uh, we would encourage your support. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yes. Isn't this something that you guys could, as a union, could sit down with the employers and do negotiations on, on working conditions? This is part of the working conditions. Yes, I appreciate that. And we do, and we have. We, we had uh, negotiations with the large 
uh, Vaughn's, uh, Albertson's, and Ralph's in Southern California uh, two years ago where we raised this issue at the bargaining table. We can't, we can't force an employer to agree to something that they're not going to agree to. Um, at those round of negotiations, the employer simply refused uh, to, in a contract, to address this issue. And as, I, as I've said, even if we were able in collective bargaining to address this issue with our own members, what about the pharmacists and large retail chains around California who are not part of a collective bargaining agreement? So it's, it's not something that, um, uh, that we believe from your standpoint, um, you should simply leave to a union to bargain uh, with an employer because the problem's not going to be solved through that uh, process. But I, I would think it's more like a, a, a ignorance on the part of the, the employer. I mean, if you would bring him to uh, her to the uh, board meeting to see what's going on, what a pharmacist did to take all, all that kind of stuff, they would understand, not even as a, a uh, you know, as a business person, the yes. uh, decision is also like with all the mandates, everything needs to follow. Yes. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I have strong sympathy, you know, for your, for your pharmacist. Yes. But then in, in the meantime, on, on the second half, like I said, like Al Alpa said, as an independent pharmacy owner, I'm thankful that they're doing this. Otherwise, I would be out of business. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Mr. Law, we would invite you to our next uh, round of bargaining with the, with, with the employers. And, and again, the, <laughs> the yes. fact that this is, we wouldn't have made this an issue at the bargaining table and we wouldn't have sponsored this legislation if it wasn't the overwhelming number one issue that we hear from our pharmacists every day. You know, when, you know, sort of the suggestion was made, well, why can't a pharmacist simply take it up with their manager if they're being left alone? Well, when the practice is that for our pharmacists, 40 to 60% of their time uh, is being left alone, this is a systema systematic problem. It's not just simply an individual issue that a pharmacist is gonna resolve with their manager. So I have a question for you. What is the solution because you, you said that you would not expect um, the pharmacist to shut down the pharmacy. Correct. If they didn't, like if the tech called in sick and now they are by themselves. Correct. So what is the, what's the solution? I, I, I haven't read every word of the bill. So what, what is the solution? Well, the solution would uh, anticipate that, let's say, uh, you know, uh, the, the bonds that uh, Song works at is continuously violating this legislation, and Song continues, even after passage of this legislation, he continues to be left alone, we would gather evidence uh, to that effect and we would bring a complaint uh, you know, to, the, to the pharmacy board to, to deal with. So that the issue would be resolved through a process of uh, enforcing legislation. We would not ask pharmacists themselves to individually take it upon themselves. Uh, to enforce the legislation. So does this legislation have some wiggle room in situations where the, um, the a tech's not there? If they're out sick. Yeah, if they're the out sick. If the tech calls in sick and the pharmacist is going to be left alone, are they, will the pharmacy then be in violation? I think that, again, w we're getting ahead of ourselves because that would be the subject of your complaint. And, you know, I, I assume that's what Vons would do. They'd come with hey, this was an individual circumstance that's not usual, and, you know, the, the, the right. again, it, you know, it, it, whoever is providing that support, you know, called in sick and wasn't there, but if they're violating it to the point that, you know, it continues to be the case that our pharmacists right. are, are spending 40 to 60 percent of their time left alone, that's another issue. Yeah, I just, if I could clarify, um, we would not uh, shut, a pharmacy would not be, unable to open if they didn't have a tech. Um, this would be a complaint-driven process that yeah. then would come to the board who would do, I mean, you would go through the, you, all of, we are actually giving the power to the board, like you would do an investigation and yes. if a um, complaint would have to be filed, there would have to be a systemic issue um, that would be raised by a worker. Okay. Um, yeah, so we would not prohibit the pharmacy would open. So, okay. Yeah. I, I certainly do not want to uh, curb any kind of public input because I think it's important and I think it's valuable. Well, we, we but I think it's time to call for the Thank vote. You. No, Appreciate and I do not. Later. Please do not be offended. Not, right. not, a, not a How many other people were planning on putting public comment? Can we just do these two really quick? Well, actually, I okay. had one more question for these um, 
for this gentleman. Um, so are you, it sounds like you're doing this for public protection. Are yes. you in agreement that, um, you know, saying that the independents um, should not be, should not have the same rules? Uh, we it's okay for a, a, a pharmacist who works for an independent to be in the same situation as the gentleman at the back of the room and, and not be protected. Well, of course I wouldn't. I, you're asking my personal. I, I would never say it's okay for that to happen. However, we agree that um, we've exempted independent pharmacists uh, from this bill because we think that this is an issue that really needs to be addressed with large retail pharmacies. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kayton Patel with Kaiser Permanente. I'm a pharmacist, and I've practiced in settings like that gentleman had described earlier where, you know, it is busy, and I think the intent of this bill is, is outstanding in, in some ways, but, um, you know, I, I think for Kaiser, we just asked that the board consider the, the, patient, aspect, the patient access implications here uh, when you make your decision, so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ready, to call for yeah. a vote? Do, ready to call for a vote. Do, do we have any business or any... Uh, any business out there that require minimum uh, employee days? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you mean Department of Consumer Affairs or you're talking about Pharmacy Board? No, just in general, any business. Oh, like DCA. Does DCA have any? I think there are nursing ratios. Oh, there are nursing ratios. Yeah, there are nursing ratios. Well, we have ratios. tech ratios already. Yeah, well, yeah. Mm. We have tech grace. Okay. Let's call for the vote. Okay. Well, right now, uh, really, the committee man. motion. Oh, go ahead. The committee motion is to support, uh, if amended, to uh, exempt hospital pharmacies. All those in favor of the Wait, committee did, Laura, motion. Did, Just, Laura has may, something. May I really briefly interrupt? So, no. um, I. <laughs> Sorry, um, I promise I'll be brief. Um, so just as an aside, we just want to clarify that mem board member Butler does work for the sponsor of this particular legislation. And so we've gone through a little analysis and there doesn't appear to be any financial conflict of interest which would prohibit her from voting. So she is entitled to vote. But I just wanted to make the record clear about that. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Laura. Okay, all those in favor. Wait, wait, so can you clarify repeat, what repeat the, the position motion. is? Mm. <laughs> the motion is to support the bill, if amended, to exempt hospital pharmacies. All those... No, the independents already so are the, in there. The, they're the already exempted. Already in. Independents are already exempted. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Is that four? Four. All those opposed? Three. It passes. Huh? Okay. Can I change mine, Epstein? Revote. All those in favor? Four. All those opposed? One. All those abstain? Three, four. Three. Three. Okay. It passes. All right, now we're going on to the regulations. Um, Do we have a quick break? Or, uh, just go, I'll just, yeah. I'll just take a break. Well, well basically, all, the, all these regulations are in your materials. That it's all for um, information except for one. And that is proposed, uh, Regulation to amend Title 16 CCR Section 1735.1, 35.2, and 35.6. Can we do the voting one? Because Stan. Has That's to the one. Okay. That's the only one, one. I'm doing. Okay. 1751.1, 1751.4, related to compounding. The regulation formally amends the board's regulations regarding the establishment of compounding beyond use dates, as it relates to sterile and non-sterile compounded drug preparations. Additionally, the regulation allows for the use of a double filtration system. As part of the discussion during the Enforcement and Compounding Committee meeting, the committee noted the need to readopt the emergency regulations given the delay in the promulgation permanent regulation. The emergency regulations expire on June 18, 2018. Without readoption of the emergency regulations, there will be significant ad adverse impact to patients related to the current requirement for the establishment of beyond use dates for non-sterile compounded drug preparations. 
Board staff recommend that the Enforcement Committee's recommendation to readopt the emergency regulations be ratified by, well, that was by the committee, which the committee did ratify. So the motion is uh, to readopt the emergency regulations. Do, Do we, we have, have public, any comment? public comment? Okay, all okay. in favor. All in favor. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Is that last thing? I, I'm not going to cover all, there, all the rest of them are just for information purposes. It's all in your materials. Have fun. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yes. yes.